We'd like to get started, so if everyone can get settled. Sergeant at Arms, are we, you ready? Good, okay. Good afternoon. I'm Councilman Rory Lanceman, Chair of the Subcommittee on the Justice System, excuse me, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and welcome to our hearing to discuss the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget um, jointly with the District Attorney's uh, portion of the hearing with the Committee on Public Safety. The fiscal 2020 preliminary plan included few budget changes for our five district attorneys and special narcotics prosecutor. Overall, the city's prosecutors received $415 million in funding for a budgeted headcount of 3,778 positions. Today, prosecutors can play a greater role than ever in promoting criminal justice reform efforts in New York. Many of the DA's initiatives that this council fought for or specifically funded in last year's FY19 budget, including a conviction integrity unit in Staten Island, pre-plea opioid diversion programs like HOPE and CLEAR, ATI units and immigration collateral consequences units have the potential to fundamentally change how justice is administered in our city, and this committee is eager to learn about the impact of those newly funded programs. We also look forward to learning about new needs that your offices may have to build upon the gains of the past. After the district, district attorneys, we will hear from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, whose internal budget of $6.5 million belies the outsized role that the office plays in virtually all criminal justice and public safety initiatives in this city. Indeed, the criminal justice-related contracts that Mock J awards and administers total $422 million each year. This includes $299 million annually for indigent criminal defense representation, $32 million for representation in the family courts, $13.5 million for supervised release programs, $16.5 million for anti-gun violence initiatives, and $13.4 million for reentry services. We look forward to hearing how this council can support the expansion of successful programs like supervised release, as well as the other initiatives that Mock J is coordinating. Next will be the Office of Civil Justice, which oversees a budget of over $150 million in city funding for civil legal services for New Yorkers. These legal services primarily support anti-eviction, anti-harassment, immigration defense, and low-wage worker employment work, which this committee specifically fought for last year. After that, we will hear from the public defenders, including our friends at the Legal Aid Society, Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defenders, New York County Defender Services, and Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. The fiscal 2020 preliminary budget for indigent defense includes $299 million, eight million more than the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. 260 million comes from the city with state funds accounting for $39 million. This covers the institutional defenders around the city at both the trial and appellate levels, the 18B assigned counsel program, family court attorneys, and conflict case providers. Pay parity for public defenders with lawyers at other city agencies is of paramount importance to this committee, as highlighted by our October 2018 hearing on the subject, and we look forward to their testimony on this issue. It is long past time for the city to pay the lawyers we fund to represent New Yorkers every day, especially those providing constitutionally or statutorily required work at the same rate as the lawyers we hire for ourselves. Finally, we will hear from the civil legal services providers who cover every other conceivable area of law that the city provides funding for representation for. Labor and employment, immigration, consumer protections, tenant rights, housing foreclosure, bankruptcy, and many others. Our city is fortunate to have such a robust civil legal services community for New Yorkers to turn to when they need help. Let me, um, at the outset, thank our uh, staff here at the Committee on the Justice System, our finance analyst, Monica Pe Peppel, our uh, unit head, Isha Wright, our counsel, Max Kampfner, and our policy analyst, uh, Keyshawn Denny. 
thank you. And with that, um, I invite uh, Council Member Donovan Richards to give an opening statement. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I am not going to read a long statement, but I'm certainly interested. I know we're here to discuss the budget, um, but certainly interested in hearing um, from the different district attorneys from the different counties on the body cameras program and certainly what have been some challenges there and, and are you in need of more resources, especially in the area of storage. Um, interested in hearing uh, a little bit on low level marijuana offenses and, and what different strategies um, the DAs are taking in light of uh, possible legalization in Albany. And then uh, lastly, I want to hear a little bit on um, something that we've started to identify, and I think the CCRB may start to look at this area as well, test lying and, and police misconduct, and uh, what, are the, what are you doing uh, in that specific area, any strategies that certainly are being put in place in that area. So with that being said, I have not much to say, but interested in hearing uh, what your needs are today. So thank you, Chair. <coughs> All right, let's get started. If um, you'll all raise your right hand so you can get sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. We, we can count you in on that, Judge Clark? Okay, thank you. Um, any particular order? Want to just go from left to right? Be my Good. pleasure. And what did we tell people? Five minutes? Yeah? The highlights. We want to get to the meat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Richards and Lanceman, for uh, enabling us and myself to talk to you about our funding needs for the next fiscal year. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, the support the Council has given us in years past. It's been very important to the work that we do, and I am genuinely grateful for your past support. To cut to the numbers. Um, and the reasons uh, behind these requested numbers, I'll explain in a moment. Our office is asking, uh, requesting a $12 million salary uh, increase to support currently self-funded programs in the DA's office, which I'll outline for you and outline uh, the details of those programs we're requesting. And as far as non-personal services include, uh, we are requesting an additional $4.025 million in programmatic and administrative needs, uh, and I'll explain what's the basis for those requests. Uh, I come to you today uh, after a number of years in this office, but very pleased that the investments that you've made in the work that we do and uh, the quality of the work that our office uh, has brought to bear on the criminal justice system has had real results. Uh, last year, there were 31 homicides in Manhattan, and that's a decrease from 46 in the preceding year, and less than half of the homicides that we unfortunately suffered in Manhattan the year I was elected and came, became DA in 2010. Uh, similarly, our non-fatal shootings numbers have uh, reduced uh, a great deal, and these are some of the most important metrics that I would look to to determine uh, is Manhattan safer today than it was even last year, and I would argue it on a number of levels that it is. Um, in addition to contributing through the work of our efforts and with the support of the Mayor's Office and yourselves to reducing violent crime, uh, we've also been very focused on reducing the footprint and unnecessary incarceration in the justice system. As I uh, believe I've, I've explained before to the committee, uh, we have drastically reduced the number of prosecutions for low-level offenses and low-level offenders. Last year, there were 42,258 misdemeanor and violation arraignments in Manhattan. That's a 51% reduction from 2010 when we, had, when we arraigned nearly 100,000 cases, misdemeanors and violations. Uh, this is the result of significant policy changes in our office, uh, referring, as was mentioned ago, around uh, marijuana, among others. Uh, but we have essentially halved our uh, caseload for lower level offenses without sacrificing public safety. And I think that is truly the goal of the DA's office, to balance our need to keep the Manhattan safe, at the same time ensuring that our justice system moves forward and becomes more fair. And I. Uh, and I believe that we are walking in the right direction in both those regards. We have much of the data, and our office is very data-centric, uh, because of the work of three critical units in our office, and they're the Crime Strategies Unit, the Violent Criminal Enterprises Unit, and the Planning and Management Unit. Now, uh, to date, we created these bureaus. They have been entirely self-funded by our office. 
Uh, these bureaus mostly commenced in 2010. Now, for example, uh, the Crime Strategies Unit that has been recognized as a best practice in, uh, in the city and I believe has been funded for the other DA's offices, uh, as well as the Conviction Integrity Unit, uh, which we started in our office in 2010 and it had so many successful uh, and, um, and great uh, units have been brought up in the other counties as well. But again, this has been entirely self-funded while in other offices, uh, these have been funded, it's my understanding, from city tax levy dollars. Now, the $12, billion, $12 million that I referred to, uh, I know that's a lot of money. And I respect that we are all trying to be frugal and use money only for the most worthwhile causes. But what I do want to say is that I don't believe it, is a, it is, can be viewed as a, uh, a, a, an overly large request from our office, considering the amount of money our office has returned to the city and state over my years as district attorney, specifically $2 billion to the state of New York and $1.1 billion to the city of New York. So while that $12 million is indeed uh, a significant amount of money, um, I think what, I'm, uh, what our office has been able to prove is that by investing in our ability to build up the right units, uh, train our personnel, uh, the city and the state get a very good return on their investment. Monies which I think have been critical for helping the city and the state handle some of their most pressing criminal justice and other needs. Uh, now, we've also, uh, members of the committee, uh, done uh, a significant had a significant emphasis on investing in our communities through crime prevention strategies. Uh, from the monies that we received from the 2015 case of the prosecution of the French Bank BNPP, uh, we have commenced a $250 million criminal justice investment initiative in Manhattan that actually spills over into other counties as well. But the goal, uh, yeah. um, the goal of that report has the goal of that program, uh, which is now serving eight, has now served 8,000 Manhattan residents, is threefold. One, to provide support to youth and families uh, so that uh, they are best able to accomplish and achieve, accomplish the goals and achieve the potential uh, of the young men and women in our community. Second, to support victims of crime, uh, to make sure that some uh, survivor communities that have been marginalized or ignored, LGBTQ or transgender, for example, that there is programming that is focused on providing them the support they need. And finally, to make sure that we are uh, being smart and that we are funding uh, data-based, uh, thoughtful programming to make those folks transitioning from jail uh, back to the community successful. And I indicated in my last testimony that our office has funded seven and a half million dollars to, uh, to uh, uh, support the state college and prison programming, which is, I think, been an essential investment. We know that if you want to do one thing to reduce recidivism, uh, it's give an individual a college, let that person earn a college degree in prison. Uh, so I want to, uh, I know I will be speaking uh, in, in response to a number of questions, but uh, we are also asking on the programmatic side uh, for support to fund the Manhattan HOPE, which is a pilot program that started in September. It's modeled after the Staten Island District Attorney's very successful program and building off our office's uh, existing pre-arraignment diversion portfolio. The project thus far has been a, a very, uh, very successful in a nine-month uh, pilot. We expect it will divert 500 people to services uh, in the relatively near future and uh, we are requesting $625,000 annually starting in fiscal year 20 to continue this important program. And finally, in terms of our, uh, of, of our non-personal services requests, uh, we, are, uh, we wanna let you know that we have leased space at 40 Worth, which is near our office, but the reason we leased that space to move some of our divisions is because we had every intention to move into 80 Center Street as part of a master plan for the New York City court system. Relatively recently, the, that, that was changed. The city decided now that it is uh, going to, uh, that, that we are actually going to uh, move back uh, to 80 Center Street and we are, uh, need to find uh, alternate space for our assistance during this time period. Our lease expires in 2020 and so we are asking for 2.7 million annually to cover the cost of extending our lease at Worth Street. Uh, members of the committee, uh, I'm happy to answer questions uh, afterwards, but we are asking for $581,000 for our Conviction Integrity Program, 
$1.280 for the Crime Strategies Unit, $3.6 million for the Cybercrime and Identity Theft Bureau, uh, $3 million for the Financial Frauds Bureau, and I'll be happy to look, go through each one of those uh, when, you, when and if you need that information. But these requests, as I say, uh, are obviously uh, important to the work that we do, and I believe important to our delivering uh, our promise to Manhattan that we will uh, make Manhattan safer, we'll make our court system fairer, and that we'll continue to bring in uh, the kind of cases that are game changers uh, for the criminal justice system in the city of New York. <clears throat> Thank you. Judge? <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman uh, Lanceman and uh, Richards, um, and as well as the members of the uh, Justice Committee and Public Safety Committee for providing me with this opportunity to be here today. I want to begin my testimony by immensely thanking this committee, uh, the Mayor, Speaker Johnson, the entire City Council and Criminal Justice Coordinator Elizabeth Glazer for all the support you have shown me in my three years in office. I am especially grateful for the funding you provided for the Bronx District Attorney's Office and the people of the Bronx in last year's budget. In light of the fact that we're only allowed to speak for five minutes and the fact that you've given us several opportunities to speak to you throughout the year so we don't have to go through everything, I've added to my addendum what we've done with, what we did with the funds uh, from last year and some of the, uh, the forecasts that we have going forward in 2019 and what we plan to do. So I will forego those comments and get straight to the point. Today, I have three funding acts of you that are instrumental in pursuing justice with integrity. One, cutting edge technology to ensure accountability, improve transparency, and provide uh, in, uh, efficiency. Two, security, compassion, and support for our victims and witnesses so that they will feel confident when they courageously agree to testify or cooperate in prosecution. And third, salary parity for dedicated experience and ethical prosecutors. So first, let's talk about uh, my request for other than personal services, the OTPS. We're requesting 4.19 million in additional baseline funds for OTP, OTPS funding. Our analysis indicates that on average, OMB allocates $6,218 per employee among the five district attorneys. Bronx County receives only $1,818 per employee. That's an underfunding of approximately $4,400 per staff member, the lowest in the city. So yes, once again, I'm asking for parity, and this time it's for OTPS. Last year, I was forced to move a half a million dollars of salary money to OTPS just to meet the need for normal <laughs> operating expenses for the offices. That included office supplies, uh, copy, you know, maintenance, transcripts, et cetera. Included in this request of the $4.19 million is a very important ask of $650,000 to meet the maintenance costs for a much needed case management system. A capital budget request of $2 million has been submitted by my office to purchase a new case management system. I inherited an antiquated case tracking system that was adequate when Atari was out, okay? So this is how bad it really is. And that was cutting edge at that time. That's what I'm stuck with now. So we need to replace it now, not only to better manage our cases and to be transparent, but to be in tandem with the city's efforts at transparency. We have much more work to do to modernize the office, to put ourselves on the even playing field with the other district attorney's offices, and most important, effectively serve and protect the nearly 1.5 million people that live and work in the Bronx. We cannot move the office, the justice system, or public safety forward without critical infrastructure and technology enhancement that, will far, for, that have been far too long have been ignored. 
In 2018, with the help of the U.S. Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance, or BJA, the Bronx District Attorney's Office undertook a top-to-bottom assessment of our analytical and te technological capacity. Of the recommendations that require immediate attention is the purchase of a case management system that can serve as a centralized database for relevant case information and have the ability to be searched, analyzed, and provide real-time statistical reporting. The new case management systems that we've researched all can provide great sharing capability between my office, law enforcement, the defense bar, the courts, and even the city council and Mock J. It will allow us to accurately track cases and individuals, including those that we divert and provide alternatives to incarceration to determine whether our efforts have been successful. The greatest benefit is sharing data and statistical information to create a common platform of reporting. And I know that's very important to this council as you have moved forward on uh, transparency and data sharing um, from the DAs. A more comprehensive data management system will improve the relationship with the Bronx community by providing transparency to policy and practices within the office. Greater accountability builds trust and the data provides reliable facts demonstrating how the office has addressed the legacy of mass incarceration and racial disparities of the past. Please support our $2 million capital request for a case management system and our $650,000 request for its maintenance. Secondly, I'm asking for funding for a witness security. Just as technological advances are shaping the work of prosecutors, social media and technology has changed the way our world functions. But it has also changed the way crimes are committed and how we react. It decreases the likelihood that victims and witnesses come forward. We are fortunate that the Bronx has a high clearance rate for our homicide, but does that not ring true for other types of crime? People are afraid to come forward. They are fearful of having their names and faces splattered across Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. When they are courageous and participate in the justice system, they are more prone to threats and intimidation. Judge, let me, let me ask you, what, what's the ask for that, the amount? Okay, there it is. It is, where did I put it? Oh, we're asking for $610,000. We need detective investigators to work in the program that I started to protect uh, those it. witnesses. Got it. All right. And I know you have a third. The third one yeah. is um, salary parity. Once again, we're asking for $4.3 million in assistant district attorney salary parity funding, which is um, the outstanding balance of the $6.3 million in funding that we asked for last year. I am extremely grateful for the $2.02 .02 million we did receive last year, earmarked for assistant DAs from years one to five. It has helped slow attrition. However, the cumulative effects of several years of high attrition continue to be felt. The average level of experience of ADAs in my office remains less than four years, and I need assistant district attorneys who are experienced and can appropriately handle all types of cases in particular violent crime. We cannot divert defendants, provide alternatives to jail and prison while continuing to investigate and prosecute crime in the Bronx without seasoned attorneys. Right. Well, I just want to say that it's an exciting time to be a leader in criminal justice. We, we are happy to serve the public as, as, um, as the DA's office. Our communities are challenging and they expect us to provide the very best for them. So, you know, I thank this body um, for the work that you've done in helping us to do that. Um, in 2019, I'll continue to be a voice for criminal justice reform that ensures fairness and humanity to all who must be a part of the system, but I can't do it without your support. So thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. That man. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee, Chairman Lansman and Chairman Richards. Uh, thank you very much for having us back, and thank you for your advocacy for all of us who are in 
on the front line of criminal justice uh, and making the city of New York safer and fairer. And we thank you for your leadership, as well as the leadership of uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, I'm lucky to come from Staten Island for a lot of reasons. One is because we have a very active and supportive uh, council delegation led by Deputy Leader De 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 Deborah Rose, who is here with us today, as well as Minority Leader Steve Matteo and, council, and uh, council Member Joe Borelli, and of course, Council Members Cohen and Mizell. It's good to see you again and to your staff. Uh, as a former staff, I have to say, as a former staff member and council member, I know you're, the dog days of spring and the budget are just ahead of you, so we thank you for your hard work on behalf of all the people of the city of New York. Um, I am beginning the final year of, uh, of my first term as district attorney for the people of Staten Island. And it's really with great pride that I reflect upon a lot that we've accomplished. And a lot of that is thanks to your help. Uh, in many ways, we have implemented uh, what for Staten Island is a new prosecutorial philosophy that seeks not only to prosecute crime, but by preventing it as well. And a lot of that is by adopting many of the policies that my colleagues who I'm proud to sit with today had already imp implemented and you allowed us to bring the 21st century uh, to Staten Island when it comes to criminal justice. By establishing new bureaus, hiring additional staff, implementing new technology, innovative programming, and a community partnership unit, we have achieved much of what we have sought uh, to do. Uh, when we came into office in 2016. And one additional area where I, I am uh, most proud uh, is, and I want to mention, is our continued success in fighting for the victims of crime. With the councils and the administration's help, we doubled the number of victim advocates, created a dedicated victim services unit, and now every victim of a crime in Staten Island is immediately assigned a dedicated victims uh, advocate uh, who helps them navigate the legal system and fight for their rights. And we must not and cannot forget that we have to fight for the victims. We continue to build on our progress in this past year. And with the assistance we received from this council and the mayor in the last budget, we created an immigrant affairs unit. We extended the hours of our domestic violence uh, complaint room and implemented e-corroboration with the help of our brothers and sisters in Queens. And I'm happy to say uh, that in the last term, uh, we have brought down our dismissal rate uh, to be on par with the lowest in the city of New York, having uh, reduced it by half. We built an alternatives to incarceration <laughs> unit, expanding the success of the HOPE program. Uh, we now have HOPE 2.0, which is an at arraignment offer of diversion supported by a peer mentor uh, and immediate services. And we do that to battle the uh, ongoing uh, substance abuse uh, crisis that we have, continue to have in Staten Island. This year alone, we've had uh, 22 deaths uh, and uh, 42 uh, overdose saves just since January 1st. We uh, also launched the HOPE 2.0 court part in Staten Island a few months ago, and we're looking forward to that being successful, building on the success of uh, DA Clark in the Bronx. We hired new body-worn camera analysts. We added a new immigrant uh, communities liaison, and we've started our conviction integrity review unit. Again, things that our colleagues have been doing and that the chairmen have spoken about, with your help, we brought them to Staten Island. We also continue to fight for a community justice center in Staten Island with the help of Council Member Rose and Borough President Otto, and we look forward to using that model to bring more problem-solving approaches, especially to misdemeanor uh, recidivists. Uh, there are just, these are just some of the many improvements that we have uh, continued to make in the past year, and we're extremely grateful to have received funding that acknowledged these needs and allowed us to make these important changes. These changes and, addi and additions have undoubtedly made Staten Island safer and our criminal justice fairer, and some of the numbers reflect that. Major crimes on Staten Island are down by 16%. Domestic violence arrests have declined by 20% in the last three years after having shown the largest increase during the prior four years. And as I said, dismissal rates in DV cases are down by almost 50%. We are continue to fight uh, the opioid crisis, but the overdose response initiative, uh, the investigation of every uh, overdose, and the whole program have helped us see movement in the right direction, and we have reduced overdose fatalities uh, by 15% over the last two years. Uh, well, I think I gotta check my bling. I blink, I think somebody's at my front door. <laughs> Nobody's home, go away. 
Uh, and this is very important when you think about uh, reducing uh, unnecessary uh, jail time or, or arrest time. Our arrest to arraignment time is second uh, in the city, uh, trailing only Queens, and is down 15% from the same time last year. So we've really reduced the amount of people, uh, the time that people are processed through the system before arraignment. Despite these successes and highlights of the last three years, there's no question that much needs to be done and we need your help. We understand that the city uh, faces significant budget uh, challenges this year uh, and appreciate that we have not been uh, confronted with pegs and therefore I think it's clear that we've all kept our, have kept our request uh, to a minimum. For us, there are three. Last year, the council was good enough to uh, fund for us a conviction integrity review unit at $425,000 PS, but that money needs to be baselined, other not, otherwise we cannot continue with that work. We've staffed it up, we've started to do the work. Uh, the money originally went to OTPS, we had to move it over, uh, but with the, with the staff's help, we've got that done. Now we need to move it to PS, uh, to baseline. We got to PS, step one, we needed to get it to uh, uh, baseline. In the area of ADA salary parity, which you're all aware about, uh, for the uh, ADAs of five years and plus over, uh, our request is $179,000 to, to, to be able to effectuate parity. And lastly, for the body-worn camera storage uh, uh, project that we're all, all undertaking, uh, we need uh, $8,000 of OTPS to increase our cloud storage capability. <coughs> uh, in conclusion, we are very proud of what we have uh, implemented in Staten Island. Um, and uh, we continue to look forward to continuing to work with this council to bring uh, prosecution with integrity and a criminal justice with fairness for all the people uh, of the city of New York, and in my case in particular, for the people of Staten Island. Thank you very much for your attention, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Let me just uh, recognize we've been joined by Councilmember uh, Debbie Rose, Councilmember Alan Maisel, and I know Councilmember uh, Andy Cohen was 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 here and I think he's going to come back in a bit. Brooklyn. Good afternoon and uh, thank you Chairman Lansman and the Committee on Justice Systems and of course uh, Chairman Richards and the Committee on Public Safety for the opportunity to address you today regarding the mayor's fiscal year 2020 January 2020 budget plan. I am grateful for the council's continuing support of my office's work, including your advocacy and support of our budgetary needs. I am also grateful for your efforts to increase the fairness of our criminal justice system. And I consider myself and my office to be your partners in doing this work. One great example is our Brooklyn Clear program, a pre-arraignment diversion program for people charged with drug possession that was funded by the council as a pilot project, and we were able to extend that program borough-wide uh, last year because you fought for us to secure $1.4 million in baseline funding in last year's budget. Last week, I was proud to announce my office's Justice 2020 plan, an initiative to reduce incarceration and strengthen community trust while continuing to keep Brooklyn safe. The document I have brought, and it's all before you, contains the committee's 17 recommendations, which I am committed to fulfilling by the end of 2020. But I need your help to do so, and this is what I want to discuss today. Implementation of each of the 17 recommendations is underway in my office, but many of these items require funding. One of the recommendations to Justice 2020 is that my office transition to vertical prosecution, which means the same prosecutor handles a case from start to finish. We have repeatedly requested funding for 80 assistant, uh, additional assistant DAs, 20 per year for the next four years to move our office to a vertical prosecution model. And once again, the mayor's budget does not contain funding for this request. Even though the city has been fully supportive of this model in other offices and has provided baseline funding to cover the cost of additional staff, both legal and non-legal. Vertical prosecution is considered a best practice nationwide, including by the National District Attorneys Association and the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. 
So I ask the council for your assistance in obtaining $2 million in funding we requested to move to vertical prosecution. We have also requested 21 new lines for lateral hires. There are several reasons for this request. One is the continued attrition of experienced ADAs lured away by higher salaries. This fiscal year alone, we have lost six ADAs to the law department where they can get a higher salary for their years of experience. We are also increasing the number of complex long-term investigations our office handles. We all know that Brooklyn is experiencing a construction boom, and we also know that where there's a boom in construction, real estate, financial markets, working safety issues will follow. Um, I'm going to expand the work of the investigations division to do more to make sure that white collar criminals are also being held accountable, and this requires additional resources. Finally, now is not the time for us to take the foot off the gas of our investigations and prosecution of violent gangs. While crime trends are not linear and overall violent crime is down it, during the last 10 years, we are all aware of disturbing trends in upticks in shootings and homicides in the first quarter of this year. Justice 2020 recommends that we use new and additional strategies to combat violent crime, and we still will be using and relying on strategies and teams that have done great work for us in driving down violent cr crime during the past several years. This task, however, requires experienced ADAs who we must replace when they leave our office for other opportunities. Continuing to keep Brooklyn safe, responding to new threats, and the successful implementation of Justice 2020 going forward depends on the efforts of many individuals, but none more than our assistant DAs, the backbone of any DA's office. These dedicated public servants have an extremely difficult job, and they do this work on salaries that make it very difficult to live and raise a family in this very expensive city, often with crushing student loan debt. I am extremely grateful to the council for advocating for salary parity with the law department for attorneys in years one through five of, of practice. With the funding provided, we were able to raise the starting salary from 60 to 69,000. And after five years, ADAs in my office will make 80,000. When we implemented salary parity, the salary of newer assistants bumped up against those of the attorneys more senior to them and in some cases even surpassed uh, the salaries of more experienced attorneys. This is known as salary compression, and through discussions uh, over the summer uh, and, and numerous funding requests to cover the cost of compression, we have been told by OMB that we're not gonna receive any additional funding. Uh, I appreciate the tremendous support of the City Council in getting to the first step of salary parity done, and I'm hoping to continue to work with you to secure additional resources for those who weren't covered by this funding. Um, finally, my office cannot do its work if we don't have basic physical necessities the office requires. The Brooklyn DA's office is in a unique situation because we're housed in a space that's leased by the city. Our lease expired last year, and we're currently in an extension. DCAS has been working diligently on renegotiating our lease with the building landlord, but OMB has not authorized the necessary funding. We're asking that OMB authorize DCAS to move forward with our new lease, um, budget the additional funding for the basic upkeep, and provide my office with long-term stability necessary to do our work and to move forward with capital projects that require a signed lease. We're also experiencing a frustrating situation with our warehouse space. In 2016, we were funded $600,000 to lease a warehouse at 210 Girolam Street, the municipal building. Uh, that um, has all of our files which were required to keep under law. The city then has sold the space and DCAS is asking us to vacate, um, taking hundreds of thousands of files with us. We cannot vacate the warehouse until we have secured new space DCAS has located a space, uh, but we haven't received the authorization from OMB and the funding to move forward. Once again, I wanna thank 
uh, Chairman Richards and Chairman Lansman and all the members of the Public Safety and Justice Committees in the entire City Council for your support. And I specifically want to thank the Council for funding in 2019 uh, domestic violence uh, programming and a one-time grant to cover the lost funding that we lost for our young adult court. Um, these are critical programs and uh, the work of, bro of keeping Brooklyn safe and ensuring the trust of our justice system is dependent on us being able to do th these kind of additional outreach. So thank you and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairs Lansman and Donovan. Thank you very much. And thank you to the council staff. Uh, they've done an excellent job and they're always wonderful to work with. Uh, as you know, our office is not requesting any new needs funding this year. However, in the event of um, certain proposed state legislative initiatives, there may be additional costs. And if so, we may come back uh, before the final budget hearing asking for additional funding. Uh, however, I would like to take my time today to describe to you um, the current status of the opioid epidemic in New York, the emerging trends in our response, the community initiatives that the Council has funded and what we're using that funding for and our critical next steps. I think it's very important that the City and the City Council know what they're getting for the funding that they put into special narcotics. As you know, we have a unique jurisdiction. We have jurisdiction over felony narcotics offenses in New York City. And I work very closely with wonderful DA's offices collaboratively, and we benefit from their energy and their vision and their strength. Uh, and we work very closely with them on the differing problems within their boroughs. The trends we are seeing in the uh, last several years have been, of course, very disturbing. The opioid crisis has led to three years of consecutive uh, decline in life expectancy for Americans, and it's the longest sustained decline in a century. However, in New York City, we have reason to be optimistic. Overdose deaths this year appear to have stabilized after seven straight years of increase. The number of deaths is, of course, still unacceptably high. But the DAs have started an impressive array of programs and outreach for low-level offenders. We focus primarily on higher-level distributors who are not appropriate for programs. But in the event we do have low-level uh, low offenders who have addiction issues, we certainly do refer them for treatment. In the past five years, our cases have resulted in the interdiction of two tons of heroin and fentanyl. And we have managed this while still reducing the number of felony drug arrests and the commitments to state prison, as you can see from uh, the charts in our testimony on page seven. But the most challenging aspect of this crisis is that it's constantly changing. Synthetic opioids such as fentanyl and fentanyl analogs permeate the black market in New York City now. And a far greater proportion of the narcotics seized by special narcotics contain synthetic opioids than in past years. The synth uh, synthetic stimulants such as methamphetamine are also more prevalent. And the reason that's important is because they're so much more potent. And to the drug dealers, they're so much cheaper. Fentanyl is about 50 times as powerful as heroin, and to the producer, it's about a tenth of the cost. Over the past year, we've seen an upsurge in the seizures of counterfeit pills containing fentanyl. Mexican cartels are manufacturing these pills, often formed to resemble the favorite pill on the diversion market, 30 milligram oxycodone pills. Last month, approximately 20,000 pills with a street value of up to $600,000 were recovered. And pills are also being pressed locally from fentanyl powder. A recent investigation that began with street sales of fake oxycodone pills led to a fentanyl pill manufacturing operation based in a residential building in the Bronx. A boiler room and an adjoining apartment doubled as a factory for a large-scale drug operation. Three defendants were arrested, including the superintendent of the building, who allegedly provided access to the rooms for pill manufacturing. The pill press, dyes, imprints, surgical face masks, 
and other drug manufacturing equipment were recovered from the apartment adjoining the boiler room area by agents in hazmat suits and gas masks. And can you imagine what a building resident much has felt if they were going down to do their laundry and encountered the hazmat suits and the gas masks? The dangerousness of this is shocking on many, many levels, and we're developing strategies to address this problem. Our strategies uh, are responsive to the three factors which have fueled this crisis, the accessibility, purity, and potency of, di of addictive drugs. Increased accessibility to addictive medications started this crisis, and most who develop a heroin addiction began their problems with pills. We continue to prosecute healthcare providers who supply addictive medication in exchange for cash and for no medically necessary reason. The second prong of our strategy is to focus on major heroin and fentanyl suppliers. And in the past five years, as I told you, we see more than two tons of heroin and fentanyl. But in 2018, our largest bulk narcotic seizures were in the Bronx, uh, where we seized about 250 pounds of narcotics destined for bagging operations right there in the Bronx. These five seizures could have produced millions of single-user bags, and each new substance has been progressively higher in purity and potency. Ms. Brennan? Yes. I, 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 I will just do want to focus on finish my, my uh, testimony shortly. Thank you very much. Uh, Upper Manhattan and the Bronx now lead the city in the rate of deaths, largely due to the increases in fentanyl and fentanyl analogs in, that air, in those areas. Uh, and so we continue our work on the supply and identifying uh, analogs and trying to interdict those. But I think the problem where we're really failing is in prevention. We have no citywide prevention strategy that's directed at those who are not yet using drugs. We have no coherent strategy in the schools. We have no uh, public campaign informing the general public who are not yet using of the dangers of drugs. And I think we are falling short. And I ask the city council to take up this cause. You have deep connections in your communities. You have the confidence of, their, of your communities. You have done so much for all of us but this is an area where we are really lacking, and we must do everything we can to prevent a future generation from falling into this desperate situation. So thank you very much for your time and your patience, and thank you for all you have done for us, for the DAs and the Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor. Thank you. Thank you. Queen. Thank you. Good afternoon. On behalf of Queens District Attorney Richard A. Brown, I would like to thank the chairpersons and members of the committees and the members of the council that are here present today. Uh, District Attorney is very grateful for what the council has done uh, for him uh, and for the office. As you know, District Attorney Brown recently announced that he will be retiring as of June 1st after serving for, as District Attorney for 28 years, the longest in Queens County history. As an office, we're extremely proud of his many accomplishments. And I know he'll be watching this today, so I will try and keep in mind that he will critique this more than anyone else in this room when I say today. Uh, keeping in mind the time references, I will be brief no matter how long it takes. Uh, uh, um, uh, among the accomplishments since the DA took office, I won't go through all the crime numbers. I, you know, we all know crime numbers are down. One number we're particularly proud of is an auto theft, which was a major concern of the people in Queens when the DA took office. And the uh, theft rate in Queens is down 97% since he took office. Uh, it used to be a car was stolen, I think, every eight minutes in Queens, and we've certainly strengthened, uh, stretched that out. One of the other areas we've always taken pride in is uh, last year, again, Queens had the best arrest to arraignment time and complaint sworn time in the city. We had the highest percentage of cases arraigned within 24 hours. That means those accused of a crime in Queens spend as little time as possible in, ten in detention before they see a judge. Since most defendants go home after arraignment, that means they go home hours faster in Queens than anywhere else. That has been the case since shortly after the DA took office because that's something he's always stressed. We, are, we continue our proactive approaches and investigations. We're always one of the leaders nationwide in electronic surveillance. We've expanded past the traditional organized crime and uh, narcotics cases into many areas, including gangs with electronic surveillance. 
Uh, one of the things we do to ensure fairness in Queens is we have an ADA respond to every lineup, and we think we're the only uh, DA's office that uh, undertakes that effort. We also, in addition to having a an assistant DA respond to every homicide scene, they res respond to the scene of every vehicular death. We have over 30 uh, alternative sentencing and community programs, including felony and misdemeanor drug treatment courts, mental health courts, and uh, veterans court, just to name a few. One of the programs I want to talk uh, quite a bit about is our Queens Treatment Intervention Program, our drug program. Uh, it is similar to our colleagues' uh, uh, Project Hope, but it has, of course, Queens variations. Q-TIP is a collaborative uh, program with Samaritan Daytop Village and Oasis Licensed Treatment Provider that focuses on misdemeanor nonviolent individuals who are addicted to opioids with the goal of preventing fatal, do opi fatal overdoses. In lieu of traditional community service, defendants are directed for clinical assessment to determine if further treatment services are warranted. If the defendant is determined to be in compliance, the cases result in an ACD. The program has been highly successful since it's an exception, with over 230 individuals evaluated and 88% qualifying for treatment. We've also seen many success stories for this program including an undocumented IV drug user named Maria. She gave birth to a child in two days before her court appearance. Immediately following the birth, she returned to using 10 bags of heroin per day. Complicating Maria's recovery was her immigration status. Ma Maria was undocumented, which limited her ability to access treatment services. Through Q-TIP, she was referred to a detox program and later to another treatment program to obtain recovery tools necessary to maintain her success. In addition to maintaining her sobriety, she was able to regain custody of her child and received an ACD on the case. Then we had Salvatore, a 31-year-old male who appeared in arraignments, nodding out and so high that he fell to the ground, requiring immediate medical attention. Q-tip staff provided Sal and, and, and assisted Sal in getting to an emergency room where it was determined that he had a spinal infection among other medical concerns. While in the emergency room, we learned that if the spinal infection was not immediately addressed within 24 hours of our intervention, the infection would have spread throughout his body, possibly resulting in him becoming a quadriplegic, or even worse, he could have even died. The medical response required Sal to remain in the hospital for 30 consecutive days and receive IV treatment. Sal was an out-of-state resident and had no family to assist him. Consequently, Q-TIP QDA staff regularly visited Sal in the hospital, even on Christmas Day, making sure his essential needs were met by purchasing clothing, toiletries, and food. Upon discharge from the hospital, Sal appeared in court and received an ACD. A program I'm particularly proud of, which I believe is unique, and certainly in New York State and not the country, if not the country, is the Queens Court Academy, an alternative school that helps young first-time offenders charged with offenses, mostly nonviolent, but occasionally some violent, to continue their education in a supervised and supportive environment. This high school, run with the New York City Department of Education, is located within our office. As again, I believe it's the only one of its kind. Uh, since its inception, 330 students have been enrolled in the pro program, and 50 have gotten their high school equivalent flea diploma. Uh, these are kids that we don't believe would have gotten those diplomas without it, and boy, that five minutes went fast. Uh, we also have a DWI treatment program, uh, and I'm going to skip to something I think is very important, and I hate to jump over everything else. Uh, one of the programs we're very much, and I think you'll be impressed by, is the domestic violence uh, alert team, or DB stat. We've discovered that the numbers of a success in the DV case vary dramatically as, as to when the defendant is apprehended. Uh, there's a marked decrease in the success of a case if the defendant is not arrested at the scene, and it increases by day, one day, two days, three days later. Uh, in the course of that time, the perpetrator is often very familiar with the, uh, the, uh, the criminal justice system, goes back to the victim, coerces the victim, scares the victim, whatever. What we did is develop a program with the PD where prior to arrest, we get the 61 numbers fed into our system. Our system then reads the 61s looking for key terminologies as threats to the, the, the victim, prior history, whatever, and identifies for our staff those most vulnerable, vulnerable cases before an arrest is made. We then reach out to that DV victim with our staff, get them to the, uh, uh, the Family Justice Center, and work with them, get them treatment, let them know they're not going to be alone. In addition, we work on finding out if there are weapons in the home and get search warrants. There is a 500% increase in the likelihood of a fatality in a DV case if there's a weapon in the home. And our uh, DV staff program has worked very well uh, on that in getting search warrants and getting the warrants out of the case. I know I'm doing my Federal Express language now, but I'll talk as fast as I can. This program was funded last year by the Council, but it was not baseline. 
Uh, it is critically important to this program, which I think everybody that has reviewed it has considered it a success. It saves lives. Uh, it, it gets people who need treatment into treatment. And we strongly urge that the council uh, would baseline that program. Um, I don't know how much more time you give me, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going until you have. <laughs> your, 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 your bell rang, but I, you know. I, I, well, it wasn't the first time the bell rang this afternoon, so I figured I'd keep that, going. No, that's, that's true, so. <laughs> Um, this is the part where you'd say in conclusion. No, that's, that's, that's down on this page. Um, uh, look, I, look, we have been very grateful what the council has done. Uh, we recognize the si situation the city is in. We've kept our, uh, our specific request, I think, very modest. Uh, I think the main thing for us is for the council, if they could baseline the funding that they gave us last year, uh, which covered not just DB step but a number of other programs, we would greatly appreciate it. And I welcome any questions you have. Thank you. Good. Thank you all for very much. Thank you for your, your various efforts, some more vigorous than others, to stay within the five minute uh, allotted. But we have a lot to do today, so please don't take it as um, any lack of interest in the work that you do. Uh, but I know that council members have uh, questions. We've also been joined by council member uh, Eric Ulrich from, uh, from Queens. Uh, so let me start the, the questioning um, with a, just a little bit of administrative housekeeping. Um, we're having difficulty getting data that we need from some of your offices. Um, caseloads, average caseload per ADA, the types of cases that take a majority of your office's resources. Um, I saw some of that information sprinkled in, in, in some of the, the written testimony that I was glancing through. But can we just go down the line and just, in terms of Current caseload for your office, the average caseload per ADA, what type of cases take the majority of your other resources, and there's some other data. All I need to know is if there's any reason that you can't provide that to us, not at this moment, because this isn't a quiz, but sometime you know, in the next week or so to the staff. Is there any one of you that wouldn't be able to provide us with the current caseload for your office, the average caseload per ADA, and the types of cases that take up a majority of your resources? No. No. No, no, no. No. Um, I'll be able to provide it, but the accuracy would be better if I had a good case manager. So. Very good. <laughs> Top marks. <laughs> Top marks. <laughs> Me too. Better case management system, but uh, we have been in touch with the council. We've provided a lot of that information over the last two years or so with OMB and Mark J as part of the application or, or the process for the uh, pay parity, but we will certainly... Uh, uh, respond and be able to respond to any specific requests. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just advised to remind you, to let you know, that sometimes what's sent to Makche doesn't always make its way to us. So I'm asking for direct from you to our finance team here. Uh, yeah. Chair, we will certainly provide that information uh, Mm. which we have, uh, but I would just very briefly like to identify that uh, caseload analysis sometimes can be misleading if it's only based on the numbers of cases. For example, just as uh, the district attorney from Kings County mentioned, uh, we may work on a white collar case which can have broad implications for protecting whether it's the construction industry or the finance industry or result in forfeiture that benefits uh, the city in its ability to meet meet its fi financial needs as our office has done. So I, I ask when you look at caseloads, also I would request that you please consider that sometimes one case can be very, very, very powerful in terms of what it brings back to the city and, uh, and to consider that balance as you look forward. Got it. Um, I have some of the numbers now, but we can firm them up later. Yeah, and I, I noticed that actually in your particular uh, file. We'll, we'll just get it to us later. They'll, they'll send the uniform request and and, and you'll fill in the information. Um, let me ask you about the issue of um, Criminal Justice Reform Act uh, summonses. I had sent to all of your offices in the last few days um, uh, a request for you to consider um, vacating outstanding uh, warrants arising from offenses that uh, we effectively decriminalized in the Criminal Justice Reform Act, broadly speaking open container, public urination, littering, excessive noise, uh, parks offenses. Um, I know f all of your offices except for, for Staten Island, I think in 17, 
had vacated um, hundreds of thousands of open sea summons warrants beyond 10 years. Um, some of your offices have gone beyond and done other vacating programs. Um, I know the press reported some responses from a couple of your, your offices, but we would like to ask you whether or not you would um, be willing to vacate outstanding warrants where the underlying offense is one of the CJRA offenses that, again, we effectively decriminalized. If I may, I, yes. we received your, your request. I think we, we would support it. Uh, I do believe this requires in-depth discussion with OCA, uh, which, you know, which we will undertake. But I, for the same reason that I think many of our offices dis dismissed the, uh, the old summons warrants from those cases, the same rationale would apply to this uh, th this new uh, uh, cohort of cases which were essentially decriminalized uh, when the C summons was stopped for those for those offenses. Thanks. Um, I received your letter and I, I will also join in that uh, request. And as a matter of fact, I had already planned on doing it. I had already had a meeting set up with OCA, so I'm going forward with it already I'm, to do another warrant forgiveness plus other things we're going to be a uh, part of that. So I'm, I'm already set to do it. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if I'm the odd man out, but uh, in, in, in my opinion, the- It's never too late to is, get no, on in. The offenses, if the offenses are still offenses and quality of life uh, offenses are very important to me as someone who was a longtime civic leader and a council member and fought for the quality of life of my community and my borough. In my mind, these, these quality of life offenses are offensive. Uh, I was recently at a uh, community council meeting where a, a woman was there testifying about uh, public urination and defecation on her property that has basically ruined her quality of life. Um, so these are still offenses. They were offenses when they were written up and people failed to appear when they had to appear, whereby other people did appear and were held accountable and, and, and were responsible. So um, although I understand that um, Forgiveness in, in, in certain circumstances should be afforded, and that's why we'll be doing another Fresh Start program following uh, the example of, of our colleagues uh, in May with OCA for people to show up and take responsibility for their actions. But I believe, and I think the people who elected me uh, in Staten Island to serve as their uh, chief law enforcement officer believe as well uh, that um, the quality of life matters and the, these quality of life offenses uh, matter as well. Uh, Councilman Lansman, first let me uh, applaud you for uh, bringing the issue to the public forum. Uh, it's a, an issue that my office uh, cares deeply about. Uh, these, you know, initially there were over 1.2 million, they're now remaining over 700,000 um, ordinary people who have these summons warrants that make them at any contact with law enforcement subject to immediate arrest. Um, these are conversations that we have been having ongoing in my office with OCA, the mayor's office, and I fully support it. Thank you. I, I think the special narcotics time. prosecutor gets a pass on this. Thanks, Bridget, for giving me your time on this one. Um, uh, uh, Councilman, we did participate in the 2017 program. We did it after a careful study of, quite frankly, virtually everything on the data sheet we got. We got your letter on Friday afternoon. Uh, yesterday I spoke to OCA and I asked them if they could give us a, a data sheet based on the parameters set forth in your letter. Uh, I assume that will take them some time. Uh, in looking at your letter and you outline the provisions of the uh, Reform Act, uh, it created a civil alternative to the criminal uh, and a presumption of the civil. Well, obviously a, an outright dismissal, there is no alternative. It's either the, the warrant stays or the warrant goes. So. I, I don't think they're uh, identical uh, to just say because of the changes you've made that this would automatically come to, uh, to bear. One of the things we've asked ourselves is, what about those people who got those summonses and went to court and paid? Uh, are they entitled to some sort of relief too? And quite frankly, if we were going to dismiss outstanding warrants for people that didn't come, uh, I would say an equity issue comes about about those people who came and did come. Uh, we have not reached a decision yet. Uh, we'll take a look with the data once we get it. Uh, I'm not sure, it was sort of a broad you know, uh, criteria that you've set forth in the letter. I'm not sure how well OCA can do with it, but when we get it, we'll take a look at it, and when we, and we, and when we do, we'll make a decision.
So we appreciate it. Um, next big topic, um, THC oil. We um, had asked the, we, we had heard that there were still people who were getting um, arrested who were otherwise eligible for the city's new marijuana enforcement uh, policy to get the um, C summons as opposed to, to, to the arrest um, for possession of uh, THC oil, either, either possessing it or, 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 or vaping it. Um, and we had asked the, the police department um, in a letter that Chairman Richards and I had sent in November um, why it is they were not including people who um, were caught with, with the THC oil in the marijuana, uh, in the new marijuana uh, enforcement uh, policy. In fact, folks were being charged um, with um, a criminal possession of a controlled substance in the seventh degree, which is an A misdemeanor, which is more substantial even than the, the, the marijuana possession charge. And today, Commissioner O'Neill committed to us that as a matter of NYPD policy, they are going to implement and they're going to include possession of THC oil in their uh, overall marijuana enforcement policy. So those folks will not be charged with a misdemeanor, um, just like people who have an actual marijuana cigarette. So um, could each of you tell me what your policy is when it comes to um, charging um, for um, uh, t uh, THC oil possession and, and do you do you consider it the same as marijuana, or do you, uh, do you how do you charge it? Uh, I indicated in my last testimony uh, uh, recently on marijuana, our office has a policy not to charge for, for possession for of THC. For THC. For THC, okay. Judge? And, well, we're not charging for the marijuana at all because of the C summonses, and if it had come through, I'm, I'm not exactly, I would have to report back to exactly how many we've seen, but if it were to come through, I would treat it as a marijuana case and, and instruct the police department to issue the cease summons. So I'm glad that they've now committed to treat, treating, the, treating it as marijuana as um, in their marijuana policy. Thank you. Thank you, and we currently, uh, in most cases, charge them as the 220.03 uh, possession in the seventh and the uh, defendants in those cases uh, or uh, offered the whole program uh, automatically, so they get the offer of diversion. Don't we will certainly, I, I was not aware of the police commissioner's uh, testimony, and so we will take a look at that. Yeah. But the, the HOPE program, which we might ask you about later, I mean, there are people who are not eligible for the, for the HOPE program, right? I mean, if they have a certain number of prior offenses, et cetera. Yeah, and, and I mean, if, if they're not eligible for DAT, then they don't get automatic hope, but they would get it at arraignment uh, for those charges. Mm -hmm. would, would you be looking, would you be willing to take a look about what, whether or not you should be charging those um, 220.03 at all? Sure, I, I'll be willing to look at it. I want to see what the police commissioner said and see what the police department is doing. I can tell you what we're doing right now, and we'll be willing to take a look at it. Thank you. Brooklyn? We charged about less than a, a dozen of those cases uh, last year when it was brought to my attention that we were still bringing some of these uh, cases under the 220.03. Uh, <coughs> I am no longer prosecuting those cases, we're treating them like marijuana. I think the explanation, I, I think, for many of us is that, you know, the statute treats that substance differently because it's treated as a controlled substance and not under the marijuana laws. I would say that um, when we look at those cases, um, they are now being routinely DP'd by my office and we have a 98% reduction in the number of marijuana cases that we put through in Brooklyn. You don't, Thanks again, special Nar narcotics, you don't see those cases. No jurisdiction, don't have jurisdiction yeah. over misdemeanors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we saw the testimony this morning and we did a quick co computer search on uh, our stuff. Uh, a, we find very few cases, uh, we can actually search the complaints for the word THC oil. We find very few cases where the, we had any of them at all. Those that we did find, we found only one 220.03, everything else was a 220.05. In virtually every case we had, with two or three exceptions, 
the THC was part of some other case, uh, and generally, almost always, uh, a lesser offense of uh, another offense. Um, let me ask you each about raise the age. Um, it's, it's budgetary impact, like what kind of resources you've had to, to allocate, um, and what kind of, how many cases you're seeing, and uh, if, if you know, you can give an estimate, um, but if not, we will want the hard numbers. Um, how many family court eligible cases are you keeping in, in criminal court? Whoever wants to start. Brooklyn, you look like you want to start. So we created a new unit in Brooklyn that deals with raised the age eligible cases. Uh, I can get the actual number of the funding that it takes to, to run that unit, but 91% of the cases that come across uh, our desk in Brooklyn are sent to family court. So is it, is it possible for you to categorize the ones that you're, you're keeping? And, and just to be clear, are, are you keeping them, um, how many of them are you, uh, you keeping with the consent of defense counsel? Because I've heard from very many people that they very many public defenders that there's definitely circumstances where it's better for their client to stay in, in criminal court as opposed to family court. Right, so there, there's some, I think we have a very strong relationship with our defenders in, in doing the work of deciding when a case goes to f uh, family court, but the overriding belief that I have is that eligible cases um, without, you know, w without uh, severe violence should go to family court. I can give you a complete breakdown of the numbers, you know, when we adjourn, uh, but it, the overall number is a 91% from my office uh, consenting to family court. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, from Manhattan. You just use the, uh, the mic. From Manhattan, we've had a total of 121 raise the age uh, defendants. Uh, 69 of that amount were, number were removed to family court, which is 53%. Um, pending are 31% still, 96, uh, uh, 31 pending RTA cases. Pending meaning they're on their way to family court? Just pending mean there, there hasn't been a disposition yet as to one way or the other. Mm -hmm. the, the, the cases that are staying, like, can you categorize what the, is it? Uh, th those you, would be cases that, as, as the, I think the Brooklyn District Attorney, whether there's uh, indications of violence, uh, those would be the, the nature of the cases that we would be looking most closely at. Uh, for the Bronx, we've had in total 34 cases. Um, 25 of them went to family court, and there's nine of them that we're keeping. Uh, I'm not sure of what the charges are. I could get back to you on that, but those are the, we've had very low numbers. Right. Well, and I've spoken to OCA, and they told me, like, the Bronx, they didn't know what we were doing there, but we weren't getting many of the right. cases. Right. Uh, again, we will ask that uh, you provide us with the breakdown of okay. stay, go, and, and, and the, the offenses. Okay. But just for now, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll sort of answer the question the same way. We, we tasked a felony assistant who's assigned all those cases to review them uh, in consultation with uh, court counsel. Uh, as well as uh, defense counsel, and uh, we've had just a handful of cases. If, you, if the Bronx was 34, you can imagine how low ours are. I'll be happy to get those numbers. I, can, I think only two have been held uh, through the youth partner and back as felony cases. They involve violence, uh, assault cases, uh, but I'll get you the exact numbers. Yeah. Uh, I neglected to bring our numbers with, the, uh, with me. I can get those to you fairly quickly. Uh, we have a deputy exec who's taken personal charge of this entire operation, and she's trying to uh, get it into a day-to-day -day basis, a deputy bureau chief and a supervisor. Uh, I don't know the exact number. Um, majority, I think, have gone to family court. Uh, we have si sought to keep a number of them, and I've heard the same anecdotal stories about a defense attorneys who think they're better off in uh, criminal court than in family court. And uh, I'm not fully sure of their reasoning, but there are definitely cases like that. Have, have any of you experienced um, any noticeable uh, budgetary impact with, with Raise the Age? It's a little confusing at the moment. Uh, I mean, theoretically, it should reduce our caseload and reduce uh, our operations. It's actually when you, you realize at times you have two arraignments. Uh, we've had a very good uh, relationship with the Corp Council. They have, uh, we have people there to 
go over it, whether they're going to get it or we're going to get it. I would say, at least initially, uh, it's had a negative bu budget impact over time. Uh, theoretically, that should change, but uh, that time hasn't arrived yet. Um, two more big picture questions, then we'll go to my, uh, my colleagues. Um, we had a hearing, uh, I guess it was last year at this point, on um, the burden that fines and fees uh, uh, impose on, on particularly poor uh, defendants. Um, but I want to ask you specifically about the various um, uh, ATI, ATD programs that you all uh, are involved with. Um, ha have you, almost all of them involve some kind of fee that a person has to pay, or, 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 or many of them involve fees that people have to, to pay to be able to participate. Um, or. Could, could you tell us about the programs that you run that do require fees, and how do you deal with people who are just too poor to, to, to pay them? I see you and Doug Knight, like, exchanging quizzical and Doug Knight glances, is shaking so. his head no that we're not charging fees. I can get him up here and ask him, but... Uh, the so none of the programs that the Queen's DA's office uh, imposes any kind of fee for a person to participate? So c come up and come up and test it. <laughs> oh, we got to wait. You got to sit. We got to swear you in. It's a it's a thing. Okay. All right. <laughs> may I borrow this chair? You may have it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you swear a firm testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Just state your name and tell us what you Doug have. Doug Knight, Director of Alternative Sentencing for the Queens District Attorney's <coughs> Office. So all of the individuals that we evaluate on a daily basis, um, when we evaluate them, we determine their financial status, and no individual is ever denied services based upon an inability to pay. If, in fact, somebody is indigent and requires a scholarship, we work with the community-based treatment providers to accommodate that individual. So no, nobody in Queens County is ever denied treatment services based upon an inability to pay. So, so there are fees, there are payments, it's just that you work with people who are unable to, to make correct. those payments. Okay, thank you. Do, you. do you have special narcotics prosecutor? Do you have those? Most of our defendants go through drug court and I'm not aware of any fees right. associated with that. Our ETIs are uh, fee-free with the exception of one program, and that one program, there's a fee associated with it. Uh, we do not prevent anyone from participating if they can't afford it. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, so I, I've been told to be maybe more precise in my questions. So we're not just talking about programs that the DA runs, but the, that people are sent out to that are run by nonprofits. Are, are, there, are there programs that, for example, Queens would might make available to somebody um, that, that is a, a, an outside nonprofit organization that has a fee which if someone can't pay, they can't avail themselves of that program? As I indicated, we, we associate with programs, proprietary programs and non-for-profits in Queens County. And again, uh, if in fact somebody is being referred from a, a Queens District Attorney program or an OCA program, uh, any individual that is in need of clinical services uh, will, be will not be denied those services based upon an inability to pay. Is that the case at the Brooklyn DA's office? On some of the outside providers, I understand that if someone's undocumented um, to get certain uh, therapeutic services, mental health services, drug treatment, that there's often an obstacle. Uh, we work with different providers to usually find 
uh, treatment for a person who might not otherwise qualify for you know some sort of public insurance or doesn't have health insurance. Uh, so I, I like to be very careful in my answer to make sure that no one's ever denied, but I do know that there's a number of people who are undocumented who we find uh, the services for, and I'm not aware of any um, situation where I've denied or my office has denied treatment because someone couldn't find a, you know, funding. But I'll get back to you in a more clearer fashion. Stand up. Yep. Uh, our answer is very similar to Queen's. Um, there are some outside providers for certain programs, like a, a scram bracelet for someone who has a DWI, and, and part of their um, sort of alternative uh, sentencing includes that, and that does have a fee. Uh, those are the only case I can think of, um, other th or the others, where there's health care, uh, mental health, um, drug treatment. Um, we work with the providers to make sure that they get the treatment they need. What do you, just to, to follow up, what do you what do you do if someone is you know doesn't have the money to pay the uh, the bracelet, for example? Like they can't well, they can't um, participate in that, that program? case there is an outside provide that's an outside company who provides that. So we we try to fashion a different alternative um, program, a different type of two step. Uh, sometimes this gram allows for an expedited process for that individual, but there are other programs as well that we will try to offer to that individual, depending on each uh, case. Uh, for the Bronx, we don't charge fees for our program. If there's any uh, substance abuse or mental health defendant, um, they're usually evaluated for public assistance, Medicaid, Medicare, so some type of government uh, subsidy. Um, we use a grant to fund um, some of the defendants in the through task that um, this does the felonies and on our low-level cases Bronx Community Solutions, which is part of the Center of Corn Innovation that does our ATI stuff They will pay the fees for that. So project reset or things like that. They would cover those I'll have to I have to check on that more I know the DWI is the interlock that does require people to have to pay and I'm not sure what the mechanism there is for those people if they can't afford to pay that. I'd have to check into that. Right. Well, if you could check on that, we would like to know. Uh, uh, Chair Lanceman, we do not refer an individual to a service if they require that defendant to pay. So we wouldn't make that referral to that service. Some individuals who are charged will pay to go to a private service uh, by their choice, but our, our ATIs would not include, we would not send uh, an individual to a, 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 an organization that required a fee that our individual defendant could not pay. That said, as part of our criminal justice investment initiative, we have invested $14 million to provide supervised release citywide uh, for a certain category of, of felonies and misdemeanors. So we are supporting supervised release programming directly with funding from our office. It's re and, it, and I would just say, to follow up, we gave a report to each of the members today, the Criminal Justice Investment Initiative, which outlines these programs in more detail. I just want to understand, when you say that, you, that there are individuals who might choose to go into a particular program that, that does charge a, a fees. That they, that they choose. They choose to, but, but if a similarly situated defendant could not afford to pay for that program, you, you've got a different program exactly. for them. Exactly. Okay. Um, all right, last big picture uh, question. Um, I know in Staten Island last year we funded a collateral consequences officer or attorney or, or someone who would advise the office on um, uh, collateral consequences issues. I assume in, in, implicit in that is that you will take into consideration when you're in your charging decisions and your plea decisions, um, a person's immigration status and the potential collateral consequences. But if you could, if you could explain your office's policy on that, how this the funding that we provided for that has worked out, and then I'd like to know each of your office's policies on considering collateral consequences in charging and, and plea decisions. Sure. So uh, we very much appreciate that funding, and we're able to bring on a very experienced immigration uh, attorney uh, who started a few months ago 
uh, in the office, and she's doing amazing work in terms of uh, informing uh, the staff, the, the ADAs and the supervisors and everyone um, about uh, immigration law, uh, consequ collateral consequences as you described, uh, and also being out in the community and being a bridge to the immigrant communities uh, in Staten Island uh, for a ho whole host of reasons. One, we want victims of crime not to be afraid to come forward uh, and understand that our office will uh, not question their immigration status if they're victims of crime, and there are great uh, many uh, services and uh, support facilities for them, including our Family Justice Center, and she's doing a great job with that. Uh, my approach to every case is to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and we consider all consequences uh, uh, in every case and try to, uh, uh, to come up with a, a charge, a, a plea, uh, or a, a, a prosecution that is fair to all those involved, the victim of the crime, the people who uh, voted uh, to have me as their prosecutor, and the defendant in every case. I will consider collateral consequences, as explained to me by um, uh, that uh, Immigration Affairs Unit attorney, um, as well as a whole host of other factors as well. And there's not one blanket policy that the office abides by. Okay. Thank you. Um, Judge? Well, I have an Immigrant Affairs uh, Unit. I have not um, hired anyone, uh, a lawyer in particular, for Im Immigration uh, Affairs or Collateral Consequences, but having been a former judge, I know what those collateral consequences look like. And again, we look at each case on each case on a case by case basis. Uh, when charging originally, we unless we know from the police, we wouldn't know necessarily the immigration status of an individual. But after the case is drawn up, we do work with the defense bar when they if it's brought to our attention to make sure that we um, find some type of disposition or charge if there should be some type of disposition to make sure that those collateral consequences uh, do not um, impact uh, the defendants. Um, I had the um, fortunate, uh, well, or unf un unfortunate, depending on how you look at it, there was a case by the Court of Appeals, a Suazo case, that came down and said that uh, undocumented uh, defendants who go through the criminal court when charged with uh, B misdemeanors, that they have the right to a jury trial. Um, that was the case that was in the Bronx. Um, of course, the, the, the law was that in New York City, a B misdemeanor a defendant is not guaranteed a, uh, a, a jury trial. So I had to make the decision on whether or not I wanted to go to the US Supreme Court to challenge that. I chose not to because I think that it was important that the uh, uh, individuals uh, undocumented should not have to go to court to prove that they're undocumented in order to get the jury trial. I simply um, asked, uh, thought that the legislature should change the law so that now in New York City, there should be jury trials for all defendants who are who are prosecuted, whether it's an A misdemeanor or B misdemeanor. And that's the, that's the position that my office is taking now. So um, that's a collateral consequence that I think I'm addressing in a different way. Okay. Thank you, Manhattan. Thank you. Uh, we have self-funded uh, the hiring of a attorney who's focused exclusively on collateral consequences issues throughout the entirety of the office's cases to support the decision making of assistance uh, in, each, in each bureau. So uh, that is how we have addressed this need to have a better understanding of a very complex area of law. And, uh, and it is our position and my belief that we should take collateral consequences as into consideration as a factor in, not the only factor, but as a factor in achieving a, you know, a, a dis disposition uh, that is both fair and consistent with our public safety responsibility. Thank you. Brooklyn? So my office has two uh, full-time immigration attorneys uh, whose responsibility is to work with our assistant district attorneys to go over the potential collateral consequences on every case. It's, it's a mindfulness standard. Every assistant district attorney is expected to be mindful of any plea negotiation or any sentence recommendation 
citation to a judge could have possible collateral consequences to an individual and these immigration attorneys are excellent. They regularly work with our defenders to try to work out dispositions that are fair and just and protect the people of Brooklyn. I believe last year they were involved in about 700 consultations on our caseloads. And we also do in Brooklyn what uh, our Bronx district attorney is doing is we don't require someone to indicate their immigration status to get a jury trial. Ms. Brennan, does this apply Doesn't come up very much. When it does, we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. With 47% with of our population in Queens foreign born, and I, I assume our criminal population is about the same, it's obviously an issue that comes up a lot. We have an Office of Immigrant Affairs that assisted in that, but essentially <laughs> it's done on a, uh, a basically a case-by-case -case basis. I believe we're the only uh, district attorney's office in New York State and one of the few in the country that serves at arraignment on every defendant a notice pursuant to the Treaty of Vienna, which most attorneys are unfamiliar with, but the United States is part of a treaty and uh, foreign nationals are entitled to assistance uh, from their uh, country. In some cases, it's mandatory if we know the person is a city of a certain uh, country. In other cases, it's voluntary. Uh, if they want it, we don't ask them uh, whether or not they're a citizen. We serve the notice and it's then up to the defense attorney to decide whether they want us to make that notification. Very, very few do. That's uh, their choice. Uh, but uh, we will uh, work with an attorney if there's a, a balance that we can strike. Uh, the problem we have is, we, quite frankly, we're often asked to provide a better disposition to a non-citizen than to a citizen. And that causes a, uh, a, a a dilemma for us and we're willing to work with uh, counsel if we can come up with a, a an offer that we'd be willing to make to a citizen uh, that will accomplish their needs and our needs and if we can do that we're more than willing to do it. Chairman Richards. Thank you chair uh, and thank you all for the work that you do uh, day in and day out. It's a pleasure to work with each and every one of you. Uh, quick question on body cameras. So the fiscal 2019 budget included 2.6 million for body worn cameras and the hiring of about 46 positions across all of your offices. Um, this funding was put into personnel services funding. However, we have heard from several offices that there are concerns about the OTPS associated with the storage of the videos. Um, so can you speak to the cost and concerns around um, OPTS? OTPS costs associated with body cameras. Also, uh, the police commissioner also uh, earlier testified that um, you, all of you have gained automatic access to the footage, so I just wanted to hear down the line if that is true, not to say that what he was saying is false, but I just wanted to get you on the record on that as well. So storage of body camera footage, are you all good or? You don't have any concerns around it, it's fine. No. <laughs> and no, my, uh, in, in my testimony, I mentioned that we have a, pr we need uh, a, a little more help with storage going forward, and we have a request in for eight thousand dollars for our budget to give us that uh, cloud storage. Nobody else needs First money. Of all, thank okay. you. Uh, what? Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are you going? There we go. No. Okay. no. Uh, at this point, it's my understanding that storage costs prospectively are not yet clear to us from the NYPD. Uh, that's my understanding. Uh, we have and are grateful for the funding that we've received for the personnel uh, on our side to, to do review. But in the future, um, I think we'll need to know what, the, what the, exactly the platform will be for the NYPD. Uh, so there's not enough clarity there. I don't, well, I don't think there's polarity, cl clarity there today. Okay, today. And then, uh, and then access to the footage, I, do you get instant I, I access? I didn't hear the commissioner's testimony. It, again, this is my understanding that um, uh, it is something that both sides are working on. I'm not sure I would say it's seamless <laughs> access today, uh, but, uh, but I think obviously both the NYPD and our office, uh, I think won't achieve the goal that this council expects, which is access, immediate access and availability, coordination, collaboration. And I, th I think we have a ways to go to get there, but we're more than willing to work with the PD uh, to solve that problem. Okay, we'll go down the line. So 
All right. Um, as far as uh, the personnel, we used that the money that was given last year to hire the personnel. We anticipated the increase of it going borough wide. So the amount of uh, personnel funding we asked for match the needs, so we're doing fine uh, with that. Um, storage, I, I'd have to get back to you. I think we do have a capital request, but I'm not sure, so I don't know how much. And as far as the uh, uploading of the uh, footage, we're well on our way. We, you know, we set up a body-worn camera unit, so, and, uh, and our, um, you know, the, we've worked hard with the police department to improve the uh, the access, so it's a work in progress. That's all I can. You don't have instant access to that. I what? Do you have instant access today? Like with internet the access? Instant, instant, right away. Access right away. Yeah, in the complaint room, we we saw okay. it. Yeah, okay, we, you we get to see okay. it. Okay, so Manhattan said no. We do. Uh, I would just say, uh, in addition to my request for funding, uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, access and sharing, it, it is a work in progress, but even in the last few weeks since now, we've seen some great improvement, and we're all moving in the right direction, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to coming back to the exec budget and saying that we're at 100%. We're Don't not worry. there yet. Police commissioner is not going to be mad if you answer the question. No, no. Uh, <laughs> no, no. A few weeks ago, I may have complained, but we uh, I just heard from my exec that we've made great strides, okay. and we're uh, very pleased with uh, sort of a renewed effort on PD's part to get everyone trained and, and to get them to explain, uh, to understand that even if they're not the arresting officer, if they're on the scene, if they're somehow related, that has to go and get shared as well. So it's a, it's a training Book issue, but they have sort of renewed their efforts and we've made great strides in the last few weeks. Okay. Well, I want to thank the city council. We did receive mon money last year to hire some personnel to do the work. We've uh, hired people um, to do the work to make sure that we are including body-worn camera and the materials we turn over in open file discovery. We believe that is a big part to uh, enhancing due process rights for people accused of crime. Uh, we've spent additional to that money, about $80,000 so far in storage. So these expenses are really ratcheting up quickly because it hasn't even been fully implemented. And in terms of instant access. My complaint room actually has access to body-worn camera video, but only if the officers upload it. And we've had a problem in making sure that all videos are uploaded. We've pushed back a little bit in sometimes refusing to accept a case until the body-worn camera has been downloaded. Uh, but that, obviously that slows down arrest to arraignment times, which is not in anyone's interest. So th there's still challenges, but I do want to thank the city council for the money we did receive and say that we do expect additional costs because storage is simply very expensive. Thank you. In our capital request, we included money for storage. I don't have the exact number right now, but we can break that out. But I never talk about body-worn cameras without uh, getting to my pet peeve on them, and I think this is the right place to do it. These systems do not have built into it a, a GPS system. I believe the police department said this morning they have, is it three million body-worn cameras? There's no way you can search three million body-worn camera footages to see who, what, when, and where. Uh, the Axon cameras I know have the capability to add GPS. What you need to do, and we're all gonna drown, we're in the first couple of years of this, and we all have, I mean, my office, we only have 30,000 because that's you know, tied to an arrest. Uh, when you look at some video, you may see seven cops at the scene, and you've only got the video from two of them. <laughs> The only way the system can work in the long run, it's going to be cheaper in the long run. You have the ability to add uh, GPS. You need to be able to search date, time, and place, and whatever, a 100-yard circle, a 200-yard circle. It's the only way we're going to know we have all of it. Uh, you, we don't know it now. Unless you're going to go through every one of them, it's impossible to know now. Uh, the way cops upload it, the way they tag it, the way they label it, you, you never know. They should do, it's a technological problem that has a technological solution. I urge them to do it now, make them to do it now. They'll enjoy it, they'll find ways to use it, but you can't search three million videos uh, one at a time. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, Chair Lanceman's question around um, fees. Uh, are, forfeit, are forfeiture funds available for the, I know that you're limited in scope of how you can utilize them but in terms of grants, uh, for instance, low-income New Yorkers who can't afford these programs, is forfeiture fund something that you can utilize? 
don't sing all at the same time. <laughs> I don't think federal. I mean, I'd have to look at the. Uh, I, I don't think federal would be available because they're very federal. restrictive. Okay. Uh, st states a little bit more restrictive, and they said we don't feel we have a problem with that in Queens as far as paying these fees. Anybody else? We do use some grant money to, to help out, but I don't know, I, I'm not sure about the, uh, the uh, asset forfeiture because of the restrictions. Okay. So I would have but to we'll get back to you check. on that. But we do use some of our grant money. Anybody else? Councilman Richards, uh, we also um, have some grant money that's used, but we have some money that we're used from federal forfeiture that allows us to do some of the work we do around ankle monitors and things of that nature for our young adult program. Ta -da. So that means that it's feasible. All righty. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I, I, so I want to just delve into the conversation around pay parity a little bit, and I agree that uh, your ADAs do a lot of great work. Um, a, a recent conversation that's not only been coming up in New York City, but nationally is around the diversity around ADAs. Uh, can you speak to, um, and I don't know if you have the, that data, you know, the makeup of uh, the ADAs in your office, office, and if not, is it feasible to get that information to the council? We will provide the exact and more detailed data to you, but roughly 20, I would say 20% of our, of our assistants are uh, men and women of color, diverse, um, and that applies for both men and, and women. I will say that I think we can do better uh, in Manhattan, and it is, it is certainly our goal to, uh, to bring in uh, a, a, a diverse uh, team of assistants that represents our community. I will, I will note that um, the salary, you know, the salary between what, one, what a person can earn in the DA's office versus what can earn, someone what can earn outside is, as uh, many of our, you know, many of, many of our superstars of, of any background are lured away from the office and sometimes it's hard to keep someone in the DA's office when they are able to make so much money elsewhere. But uh, in answer to your question, I am, uh, I feel we have, we have done well, but we actually can do better, and that really, I think, is around mentoring and providing support within the agency uh, for for diverse assistants, so that they feel, uh, you know, that they. Uh, right. are, and I, and I, I don't want this to be a gotcha moment. I just want to put it on everyone's mind um, that this is a conversation that is coming up more and more, um, and you know, I think as we talk about improving the justice system, it's critical that there are communities all across the city that are certainly reflected um, in your offices. And the same conversation we have with the police department about ensuring that that diversity is certainly taking place. And for any or agency or organization, you know, as the city moves to being primarily uh, majority people of color, which it is, you know, we want to make sure that uh, our communities are also, um, you know, at the table um, in the justice system as well. So I don't want this to serve, I'm not looking to get, to do a gotcha moment, but I think that as turnover and attrition and people move to other places, um, that that should certainly be something on your minds as we move forward. Can I get, well, uh, and if anybody else right, wants um, to chime in. Well, as far, to, as far as the Bronx is concerned, they do have a district attorney that reflects the community, so. That's one thing that I'm happy about. But there's still more work to be done, even in my office. Um, you know, I, I started a strategic recruitment plan now where, I mean, I personally go out and recruit the law schools and uh, alumni associations and, and things of that nature and, and go to different conferences as well and make sure that I send my executive staff out as well. You know, but we're all vying for the same folks, so sometimes, you know, it, it's more difficult, but it's something that is intentional, and uh, you know, I'm mindful of it each and every day. Not only with the assistant DA, but all of the staffing uh, in my office. Um, the the Bronx is the second largest employer in Bronx County, besides Montefiore Ho Hospital, which builds something every day. But um, in the meantime, I you know make sure that it, it, it's intentional that we hire people from the 
community, uh, from the Bronx community, and they reflect the community that we serve. So, but I can get you the actual statistics, but it's compliance is something that we work with all the time. I neglected to say that we have a chief diversity officer, which is a position that we started roughly two or three years ago. And that has been an important, you know, a very important executive role in our office. And it's, again, just part of the process. Yeah, it's a great question, and, and I thank you for raising it. And we could use some help with it out in Staten Island because um, we, uh, I recognize the issue immediately when I came into office, and I've made some, uh, I think, some great headway, and certainly in terms of leadership. Um, just, um, you know, I have a total of 25 legal leaders, if you will, bureau chiefs, deputy bureau chiefs, executive. 15 are women uh, on the legal side, so 60% of the leaders are, are women. Uh, three minority and self-identified -ident minorities are in the leadership position, so 12%, nowhere near where it should be but more, a thousand percent more than it was when I got there. And to the leadership in the non-legal uh, position as well. Uh, and then across the non-legal uh, positions, paralegals, victim advocates, uh, we've uh, really increased the diversity by uh, double digits of close to 50%, I believe, um, as well as language uh, capabilities. I did not have an ADA who spoke Spanish when I came in, I now have three. I now have an ADA who speaks Arabic. I'm gonna have uh, two that speak Russian, uh, important for Staten Island. So it's an ongoing project that I work on, uh, one hopefully who speak Urdu coming in the near future. But it's not easy because it, it, is, it is a goal of mine for the non-legal staff, and I'm proud of what I've done there. But with the legal staff, for the reasons discussed, it's not easy to recruit people generally. Uh, and if you know someone of color who wants to be a prosecutor, and has the credentials, it's, 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 it's very well seen to go to the Manhattan DA's office or the uh, Bronx DA's office or the Brooklyn DA's office or the Queens DA's office and they kind of see us as last. So if you know any young people who are coming out of law school and want to come out to Staten Island and join my office, I look forward to interviewing them. <laughs> we'll see if my colleagues on Staten Island agree with that, but okay. The recruitment of uh, diverse candidates for assistant district attorney positions is something that I've taken very seriously. Uh, last year, I followed Cy Vance, and for the first time in the history of my office, we hired a chief diversity and inclusion officer uh, whose job is to um, assist in the recruitment, and retention, and enhancement of lawyers of color in my office. I'm, you know, I. Roughly about 35 to 39 percent, depending when you ask me that question, are going to be uh, lawyers of color. We have about 33 percent of our uh, supervisory staff, that lawyer supervisory staff, are people of color. Um, you know, in terms of other types of diversity, uh, at least 75 percent of my executive staff are women. And uh, we continue to look to figure out ways of, you know, diversifying the office. It is something that I believe uh, is very important to the people and the confidence they have in our justice system. And it is true that all five DA's offices really compete for a, a very similar pool and a very small pool of lawyers that are lawyers of color graduating from our law schools. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I should skip this one. The um, attorneys in my office are appointed by one of the DA's offices to my office, and so if they're having difficulties recruiting people of color for their offices, obviously it will be reflected in mine. Um, my uh, non-legal staff, we have very good track record on diversity. Um, the legal staff, most of our uh, assistants of color are on the executive staff or our supervisors and have been in the office a long time. Uh, we do have a, a chief diversity officer as well. Thank you. Uh, once a year the Law Journal publishes a uh, report and uh, I, all the information I think is voluntarily reported. I have the uh, report from 2018. I mean summarized if you want it. It has the five New York City DAs, the U.S. attorneys and some of the local DAs. What I don't have with me, though, which I think is equally important, we have a breakdown of the law school populations. Uh, we don't recruit from the population at large. We recruit from the law schools. Uh, in our case, there was only one law school in New York State that had a diversity uh, uh, 
population greater than the population of uh, minorities that we had in our office. Uh, and this is where we recruit from. Uh, unfortunately, I believe the nationwide number is 5% of lawyers are minorities. So uh, we have to recruit from that pool. Uh, I think we are all uh, aggressive in re recruiting and uh, we all make an effort to uh, make our office as diverse as possible. Uh, but um, it's, it, we're recruiting in from a small pool. Okay, great. Uh, and I would just say, you know, that speaks to a larger systematic issue, whether that starts from, from the education system, p p public school systems um, in New York, but also I, I think there could be some room for a stronger partnership probably with CUNY um, and SUNY possibly um, and, and sort of working through this a little bit more so that we can create that pipeline of opportunity there. Um, so I look forward to, to working with you all on that. Um, can you just go through, so obviously the NYPD has changed their, um, uh, their policy on marijuana and, and low level offenses. How, how much money uh, do you anticipate that this policy change has uh, saved you and saved the city? Being that there's less arrests, In terms of numbers, I think our numbers are very much along the lines of Brooklyn, about 96% or 98% less marijuana prosecutions this year than in the preceding year. That obviously, if that's, if, um, that I think translates, I can't tell you the exact dollar amount, but, but clearly that's uh, many thousands of cases that are now not brought into criminal court and that will save NYPD time, assistant time, judge time, court officer time, and, and, uh, and defense lawyer time. Are any of you still prosecuting low-level marijuana offenses or not? Well, in Brooklyn, for example, I'll put through a case and prosecute someone who's driving and smoking marijuana at the same time, you know, a case where the marijuana usage is creating a public safety risk. Um, but there's, a nine, again, a 98% reduction. In 2013, uh, we were looking at over 16,000 marijuana possession arrest in Brooklyn alone. Um, if we put through 100 this year, that, that it seems like it would be too many. It would probably be way less than that. Uh, again, if the police department writes it up and it's written as a misdemeanor, we will take it. Uh, almost none of those cases survive arraignment. Uh, they usually uh, you know, either ACD or uh, placed with discon. Um, I checked this morning as, or excuse me, as of last Thursday, there were only two defendants from Queens uh, in jail on marijuana. Uh, both of them were felonies and both of them were because they had outstanding warrants uh, on other matters. Uh, there are very few of these cases that are coming through and again, virtually none of them survive arraignment. Save any money. How did it affect your case? Uh, I don't know if it so. saved us any money. It didn't really cost us any money. Uh, the, the, Okay. There's a uh, system the police use uh, called the EAP for Expedited Affidavit Program. Mm -hmm. The police department does the complaint, they sign the complaint, they send it to court, we send it over, and uh, that's pretty much how all of those cases are handled. So it's, uh, for me, it's a, 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 virtually it's a zero-sum game. I mean, we haven't been able to uh, figure out exactly how much each individual one of these cases cost. I've heard estimates between $1,500 and $2,000 to prosecute a marijuana arrest. I mean, we're talking about, you know, over the last few years, tens of thousands fewer cases. So I believe that there's been a substantial savings um, in not putting those cases through. And I can tell you for the assistant district attorneys, not having to work on those cases, processing them, um, standing up on them, um, is allowing us to focus them on the other work. Yes, sir. Uh, in the Bronx, um, I'm not prosecuting them anymore. As of January, I made it official policy. At first, I was trying to work with the police department to make sure that they gave the summonses or whatever, but it seemed like things were still coming through, so I'm, you know, I'm declining to prosecute them. Um, if there's a warrant or whatever, we make sure that they clear that up. And to make sure, um, we're talking about cases where they're only charged with marijuana. If there's other charges, then um, that's something different. I, I couldn't tell you whether or not there's any savings. I mean, I haven't been able to um, 
I, I don't really know that, so I would have to get back to you to see if there's some savings, but we, you know, I'm not going forward with those cases anymore. And uh, our answer would be the same as Queens, that if the cases are brought into us, we write them up, but they're mostly uh, involving uh, either other charges or certainly Staten Island being a case with some, a place where so many people still drive, a lot of them invo involve driving cases, uh, we write them up. But the volume of cases overall have come down, and it's hard for me to quantify the savings for that. Okay, so Queens and Staten Island, I look forward to working with you. Last question, and then we're going to go to Council Member Ulrich. Uh, I know there's a lot of conversation around discovery reform in Albany. Uh, where are we at? Uh, can each one of you speak? Are you in support of it? It could be a very brief answer, yes or no, or, or even if it's a no, what are some of the challenges you see with discovery reform? in a, a brief minute, but just want to get on the record where we are with that. Uh, our office is very supportive of reform along a broad number of criminal justice procedural issues. I think that uh, I'm not exactly sure what the state of decision making is in Albany and amongst the legislature on this particular issue. Uh, but I believe that we will find uh, a compromise. Uh, now challenges for us that we've addressed to the legislators uh, principally revolve around uh, victim and witness safety. Uh, at what point in the process should one provide the addresses and, and contact information for a civilian witness? It's obviously uh, important to both sides to prepare for the defense, but also to ensure your, your victims that you are, um, you're, you're fighting for them. And, uh, but we are supporting the, we are supporting and involved in the conversations, and I believe they would, I, my hope is that we'll, they will be resolved in the next day or so. I am also supportive of the reforms that are going on, have been in uh, direct conversations with the, uh, with our elected officials in Albany in regards to discovery, uh, bail, and, and uh, the speedy trial. Um, I, you know, I'm in favor of it. Again, witness safety is important. I mean, we, you know, it's unfortunate that the, the narrative keeps me in that DAs are against it. We are not against it. It's, it's helpful for us to make sure that the victims get their day in court as well. So there's two sides to this. And, you know, I, as a former judge, I know how important it is that you don't hide the ball to, to the last minute. Uh, you know, I've never been in favor of it. I'm training my assistants that regardless of what the law says on the books, just because it says we don't have to turn something over until a certain time doesn't mean that we can only do it at that time. So it's, it's just been a, a, a culture change in the way that you train the assistants, but I'm in favor of it. I look forward to the change and whatever compromise they come up with, after 20 years, there's a need to reform it and this is a DA who looks forward to it. I agree with my colleagues, and we've implemented already in our office a lot of early discovery uh, procedures uh, that we're very proud of. Uh, but I want to underscore uh, what they said about the fact that uh, some of the reforms that are being discussed in Albany can put witnesses, uh, confidential informants, and in particular victims uh, in jeopardy. Uh, and in my comment, I underscored the fact that in Staten Island, we focused a lot of our work on fighting for the rights of victims, uh, having victim advocates and, and helping them through the process. Um, a lot of the discussion about criminal justice reform in society today, and I fear in this hallowed chamber as well in, as in Albany, forgets too often the fact that in, in most uh, cases when someone is charged with a crime, there is a victim uh, or victims of that crime. Uh, and we've had hearings uh, that we've been asked to come to to talk about uh, discovery processes and changing uh, laws to protect the rights of people who are accused of crimes. But I haven't seen very many hearings uh, about victims, uh, about what are the rights of victims, uh, how do they recover their lives, how do they get their life back on track if they're a victim of assault or shooting uh, or uh, a, uh, a vehicular uh, crime. Uh, so uh, I believe that any discussion that goes forward that speaks about criminal justice reform whether it's discovery, whether it's bail, uh, whether it's speedy trial, also contemplates the rights of victims. We seem to have lost that 
Uh, and I hope that uh, the leaders of this committee and the council here will continue to keep that in mind because that's where I'm worried about. We're not having that discussion uh, and I don't know how we've lost that uh, from our discussion. In Brooklyn, we've been a longtime supporter of transparency and open file discovery. I continue to support measures that make our criminal justice system a more fair place, a place where people are not, especially our defenders, are not required to uh, prepare their cases in the dark without information. Um, and as I've indicated in the op-ed that I was a part of, you know, trial by ambush. I will say that the current, uh, there is a, cur a concern that I share with my colleagues in terms of the discovery reform, which indicate that 15 days after the arrest, arraignment, that a witness's name, date of birth, home address, phone number would have to be turned over. Um, the current uh, provisions for protective orders, I think, are often never uh, not uh, fleshed out that we can show a good cause for that at that immediate time. I think that uh, when necessary, when that information needs to be turned over, it should be done closer to trial. But it's, it's very, um, it's going to be a big hardship uh, to tell witnesses who may be reluctant in the first place, especially in, in communities of color, that we are going to turn over your home phone number and your address um, to a defense attorney and their investigators and possibly to the defendant and their family. So I ask that, you know, I've had this conversation with the electeds that uh, up in Albany who are friends in Brooklyn and ask that they figure out whether or not there are alternative contacts that could be provided, not to prevent a defense attorney from reaching out, but not causing us to provide such, you know, direct uh, information to witnesses. And it's not just witnesses of violent crime. If you were a victim of identity theft or, you know, credit card fraud and someone stole your check and then we have to turn around and say, well, your, his proper name, his proper date of birth, his, his address, his name, you know, um, is something that I think will chill um, people's willingness to participate in our justice system. I know that the countervailing arguments is that it's done in other places, but we do things differently in New York, including having sworn grand jury testimony and providing other avenues to um, have contact with witnesses. In fact, we have a homicide case currently pending in our office right now where the judge asked the DA to bring in witnesses for the defense so that they could um, speak to them. I think there are other ways of doing this, but I am fully in support of the discovery reform. Now, grand jury testimony and police reports wouldn't have that information, correct? And your office has been the home addresses. While. You mean? No, I'm just saying like they. Okay. We know who our witnesses are. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And there's you know another point which is you know on cases that and I'll let a uh, special narcotics prosecutor talk more about it, but issues with confidential informants just raising the fact that we're seeking a protective order may uh, in, endanger people's lives when the confidential informants. One of my big concerns is um, the wording in the reform package as it stands requires the release not just of witnesses who would testify, but information about people who may have information relevant to the crimes, which would include confidential informants who would never be called at trial who did not have, uh, did not witness anything, but may have provided information in my cases regarding major cartel organizations, may themselves not be here in this country, may have family in other places, uh, and we know the brutality of the cartels. The language is very loose, and it, it it's, uh, but the, if it's the law, it's the law. Uh, we're lawyers. We can craft language which is uh, more thoughtful, more careful, uh, and could offer the kinds of protections we need. But I have deep concerns about confidential informants information being revealed to anybody or even telling a defendant that we have to seek a protective order because we have to conceal information, which would indicate that there is some confidential information down the line. And what we know about cart 
in these brutal criminal organizations is if there's any question, they'll just, uh, you know, kill someone. It, it's not really they're going to spend a lot of time sorting it all out. Uh, and I have deep concerns about th this proposal. I don't think it's well drafted, certainly not with those kinds of concerns in mind. And here in New York City, I think that's something that we should think very carefully about. Thank you. Uh, the district attorneys are not opposed to change. It's a question of what the change is. Um, without knowing exactly what it is, uh, th there's so many bills up there. One provision in one of the bills would give the defense a right to search a witness's home, basically, and try and it's tough enough to get people to cooperate now, let alone if they think the defense can get a, uh, an order and go search their homes. But there is compromise out there. The chief judge, first Judge Lippman, now Judge DeFiori, created a justice task force. The justice task force has recommendations on discovery, has recommendations on bail. It wasn't written by the DAs. It wasn't written fully by the defense. It was a compromised document. I would urge you to review the Justice Task Force recommendations on discovery and bail and take a look and see if they're not reasonable. We think they're reasonable. Is it everything we want? No, it's a lot of it we don't want, but I think it's a reasonable basis to move forward. The idea of, again, no one, if you have ever seen jury selection late, you see the lengths people will go to avoid getting on a jury. Times 10 what people do to avoid being witnesses. People don't want to be a witness, let alone if their identity, I, Everything but their social security number is disclosed within two weeks under one of the bills. We urge you to take a look at the Chief Judge's Justice Task Force recommendations and see if they're not reasonable. Thank you. I'm going to uh, close out, but I just also want to acknowledge and say that Dia Gonzalez already gives over a lot of things, and would you agree to duplicate what he's doing technically? We give over almost he everything. He gets the gold star today. In criminal court? Right. Maybe not the gold star, but close to the gold star. Well, I might give the star a different color, but uh, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I respect D.A. Uh, Gonzalez. I respect uh, his position. Um, uh, uh, we disagree. I think what we do in reality is somewhat close to what he does. Uh, we just don't declare it as a, an open file discovery thing. We have a conference system which guarantees every defense attorney a meeting with a boss before the case is even indicted, and a lot is exchanged at those meetings. Uh, and that's something we do, and anybody else is free to adopt that too, but this is how we uh, handle it in part. All right, thank you. I'm gonna turn it back to Chair Lansman. Thank you. Councilman Ulrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairs. Um, I first wanna begin, uh, before I ask my question, just uh, commending, I'm sure that all of you would join me in commending uh, Judge Richard Brown, our retiring district attorney, on the extraordinary job he has done serving uh, the people of Queens County and the state of New York. He is leaving behind uh, an extraordinary legacy from the Family Justice Center to all of the individual bureaus and, and specialty courts that he was involved in setting up. He's had such a transformative role in shaping the direction of Queens County and improving the lives and the quality of life for the people that live in Queens, including myself. Uh, I, I can't say enough nice things about him, and I know that he's leaving some very big shoes to fill, uh, but uh, he really is the embodiment of public service. And he's raised the bar, I think, for, for every district attorney in the state of New York in such a positive way and inspiring way. So I want to thank him for his service and please relate. Thank you on his behalf. I'm sure he's watching right now. Maybe, but, uh, and he's still serving the people of Queens until June 1st and knowing him, he'll probably be there until midnight, uh, June 1st in his office, making sure that uh, whoever takes over is, is, uh, is getting a, a borough that's in much better hands than the way he found it 28 years ago. So thank you again. My question uh, is involving the recent law that was passed that revised the statute of limitations uh, for sex abuse cases. Have, have any of your offices uh, seen an increase in the number of complaints that have come in, people that have now come forward to say that they were victims of sex abuse? And how is your office now handling some of those cases, not individually, but you know, more generically? Uh, the changes, as I understand it, are in the civil statute of limitations. It's not going to have an impact uh, on the criminal statute of limitations. Oh, so that won't allow for any prosecutions to take place? I thought there was a one-year window a, that was I understand it, there'll the, be a uh, one-year window that opens this summer to allow civil lawsuits, uh, but it, it doesn't change the criminal. Oh, it did change. 
Is that true? I, I'm I think it did change the criminal. I think it added five years to the um, the statute of limitations, so they have that's going not forward. From, right, going forward. Oh, right, going forward. So that has win the window, the, the the retroactive part of it, if you will, is civil. Yeah, look back is for one year for the civil. But it added uh, five years to the amount of time that a victim would have to come forward to claim that yeah, they were. Yeah, I think yes, I think it did. I'd have to check, but it, my understanding was it did change the uh, the statute of limitations. They increased it by, I believe, like five I, years. I think I think Brooklyn wanted to say something. Okay. Right, not for existing cases going forward. Right. Brooke, you said, Mr. Chair, Brooklyn wanted to add the Brooklyn DA wanted to add something. Was that? Oh, okay. All right. No, he had indicated that was the case. Did you want to add something, Eric? No. I'm okay. okay. Mr. Vance yeah. wanted to. Uh, Very briefly, I think our uh, increase in sex crimes has been less than 2 or 3%, so it's not been a, an enormous amount. But I do think that, and I think all of us are recognizing that, uh, our offices are having to, uh, to use new strategies to address victims and survivors of sex crimes uh, to make sure that we're making prosecution available for, for those who previously may not have felt comfortable coming to the police. We started a, a workplace violence task force, which has 15 lawyers in it now, going out to the workplaces, uh, particularly dealing with large corporations, both in training and in making sure that uh, businesses know there is a, that, that they can come to us directly with any allegations of criminal sexual abuse. Well, that's great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your indulgence. I, I really waited. Uh, a long time uh, deliberately because I just wanted to convey once again my deep appreciation and my respect and my admiration for Judge Brown and, uh, and I hope that he stays active in, in civics and, and in the public discussion because I, I think that a man of his uh, integrity and his knowledge has so much to offer even after retirement and, and however I can be helpful, I would love to be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Powers, do you have anything? No. Good. I have one last question that the, the, uh, the team here make sh uh, wanted to make sure I asked. Are there any new needs that your offices uh, request uh, funding for that were not included in the fiscal 2020 preliminary plan? This is your opportunity. Any new needs that were not um, presented in the fiscal 2020 preliminary plan. I, I'm told all of them that we put in for Queens. <laughs> if the answer is all of them, that's fine. All of them, yes. You're on, I need a, you're on the record. Everything we ask for. <laughs> yeah, everything we ask for is not in the plan. All right, make sure you send us the list. Good? All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Mark Jay.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you can please take any conversations outside so that we can have the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice up. Thank you so much. Any conversations outside so that the other uh, parties can come in. Thank you.
folks, um, can I just have your attention? And we're about to do Mach J. Um, we're probably going to lose this room at 6 o'clock because there's an event next door which is not going to be quiet. It's a uh, and, and, uh, celebration tonight, I think, of Irish American history, and they've got um, music. So um, we're going to do the best we can to squeeze in what we can in the next hour and five minutes, uh, and we will play it by ear. Ms. Glazer, are you ready? We, um, Sorry, is this on? Yeah. Could be. Can we swear you in? Yeah. Good. Do you swear a firm testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Terrific. I do. And you do too. Good. I'm going to set the clock for five minutes and let's go. Great, thank you. So uh, we were originally given 10 minutes for an opening statement. I understand that the chair is eager to move this along. You have my written statement, so I'll give you some of the highlights. Um, I would like to introduce my, some of my senior team who's here to assist me. Thank you. Uh, in case there are other questions. Um, so sitting behind me are Eric Cumberbatch, uh, who heads up the Office to Prevent Gun Violence, Ozzy Cruz, who heads up uh, our finance division, uh, Renita Francois, who is the head of uh, the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, uh, Karen Scher, who's my first deputy, Susan Summer, uh, General Counsel, Aaron Pilniak, uh, the Chief of Crime Control Strategies, and Dana uh, Kaplan, who heads up uh, our Rikers and Raise the Age efforts. Uh, so today, more New Yorkers can learn and earn and play more safely in their communities than they could five years ago at the start of this administration. At the same time, ever fewer New Yorkers experience the touch of the criminal justice system or time in jail. New York City now has the lowest incarceration rate of all large cities in the United States. Uh, when Mayor de Blasio's administration began uh, in 2014, there were north of 11,000 people in the city's jails. Uh, at the end of last year, there were below 8,000. Today, uh, the census uh, in our jails is 7,881. Um, yet crime still happens and racial disparities and deep problems of fundamental unfairness, primarily for people of color, persist. As we reduce crime and the jail population to unprecedented numbers, we face an inflection point that presents ongoing challenges as well as rare opportunities we must seize. Democratizing how we keep the peace will make our neighborhoods and our city even safer and fairer. We know that for decades, crime has continued to concentrate in the same neighborhoods along with poverty and unemployment, and confronting this legacy requires developing shared solutions from residents of all ages, community-based organizations, and city agencies as diverse as the Parks Department and the Department for the Aging, as well as from our law enforcement partners. It also calls for acting on the decades of experience and research demonstrating that safety is the organic result of access to learning, work, and play, along with revitalized physical environments that bring people together and promote civic engagement. To drive towards these goals, we're pursuing an array of initiatives, many of which can be grouped under three broad strategies we highlight today. I'll summarize them here. You have the, uh, the testimony in front of you. Our first strategy is partnering with New Yorkers to produce a safer and more inclusive city. Uh, there are several different initiatives uh, that our office uh, coordinates. 
uh, and first among them is the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety that works in 15 neighborhoods most plagued by violence uh, and brings together, most importantly, neighborhood residents, about 20 CBOs and city agencies in a joint effort to focus on problem identification and problem solving, both at the individual level within developments in surrounding neighborhoods and then to raise up at a system level. The work is very rich and deep and dynamic uh, and worth reading about, I think, uh, in the testimony and some of the work that's on our website. Another of our key strategies is operated out of our Office to Prevent Gun Violence that Eric Cumberbatch leads. Um, we continue to have the lowest incidence of gun violence of any major U.S. city, uh, but the work of the Office to Prevent Gun Violence is very particular and very important because it works with uh, approximately 60 organizations across the city in 22 neighborhoods uh, in order to build safety from the neighborhood up. Uh, to work with neighborhood groups, community groups, violence interrupters, uh, employment programs, and others uh, in order to reduce gun violence. Uh, and most importantly, these are not just lofty thoughts or uh, inchoate ideas, uh, but uh, evaluations that the John Jay, that John Jay has done of the Office to Prevent Gun Violence and his efforts have shown significant reductions in gun violence uh, when compared to uh, comparison sites. And there was one more thing you wanted to cover? Uh, well, the second, of course, major effort that we are coordinating in the city is to close Rikers and to build borough-based jails. Uh, that is very deep and important work. It is essentially has three parts to it. Uh, one, crucially, is reducing the population, and that encompasses within it uh, a broad array of criminal justice uh, reform efforts. Uh, the second is changing the culture of the jails inside. There is no point in moving our jails if we do not do that. Uh, and the third is building uh, the humane environments that provide dignity to both people who are incarcerated uh, and uh, people who work within the, the jails. Uh, much more about that as we start the Euler process uh, next week. Uh, so much, much more to say, um, but uh, I think those are some of the highlights. I guess just one more thing I would, uh, I would like to highlight um, is uh, is the work that we've done led by Susan Summer in my office around uh, cannabis. Uh, in December, our office, uh, together with uh, multiple agencies across the city, uh, produced a report uh, with a very, uh, a very detailed series of recommendations uh, relating to how the legislation potentially could be shaped um, in order to, uh, to create a fairer system um, and one that provides opportunity to some of our more disadvantaged neighborhoods uh, and, in, and, and as part of that uh, contains within it certain criminal justice reforms as well relating to expungement, um, expungement of records. So that's the Jiffy version. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. We have your written testimony, and we have the, the benefit of having Mock Jay testifying before our committee on a somewhat regular basis. So um, we're not unfamiliar with the We work. always look forward to that. Us too. Um, we're not unfamiliar with your, your work. Uh, so let me ask you about a follow-up on a hearing that we had um, last year on the issue of pay parity. Um, as you know, uh, it's been a topic uh, that the council was very involved in in the prior budget. Um, we're going to hear testimony later from uh, public defenders. Um, has, do, do we have the, um, the, the graphic up? You know, when we talk about parity, we, we're not talking about parity with the private sector, and we're not talking about necessarily parity between the, 
the district attorneys and, and the public defenders. Um, we're really talking at the very least parity between the public defenders and the district attorneys and other government uh, attorneys. And, and so just like using the New York City Law Department as an example, on the, on the screen um, is the average salary of the public defenders compared to uh, attorneys at the Corporation Council. <clears throat> and it starts with a significant gap, 68,000 to 63,000, and that gap grows only wider. And I know you're aware of the problem because, as I said, we've had hearings on this and, and it was a subject of much debate in last year's budget. So can you tell us, has Mock J done any work since the pay parity hearing um, last year on you know, what it would cost the city to bring our public defenders into parity with other comparable government lawyers? So I guess I, I'd first like to say that um, the public defenders are obviously a crucial part of our justice system. It goes without saying, actually. Uh, and they are an incredibly important part and partner for much of the criminal justice reform work um, that we do, and we uh, value very much uh, their work uh, and work with them literally, I think, every day. Um, having said that, uh, I think that we are actually in quite a dynamic situation with respect to um, the defender's overall budgets. Uh, and I say that for a couple of reasons. First, um, we have just uh, reached the conclusion of contract negotiations um, and a new contract was started for uh, the uh, defenders on January 1 um, with a significant increase uh, in their budget. Uh, so up about 13% from FY15. Um, and while, of course, uh, work cannot simply be measured by cases, I, I totally understand that both for the DAs and for the defenders, caseload is not the only uh, measure. Um, I would note that there has been a substantial reduction in caseload. In addition, uh, the defender's budget is a little different from the DA's or indeed from Corp Council uh, in that there are multiple sources uh, of funding for their offices. And most significantly for us, and this is why I say, among other reasons, that it's dynamic, uh, is that the state, which has uh, traditionally contributed some money to the defender's budget, uh, has now stepped up in a very, very significant way through indigent legal services uh, with an increase of about $17 million uh, that we anticipate over the course of the year. And while we don't have, uh, and that will go up by some significant amount over the next five years, uh, and while we don't have our specific allocation for New York City yet uh, for next year, we are able to see what the statewide uh, number looks like, which is double what it was for this year. So um, all of these are things that we are looking at. Uh, we are actively engaged with the defenders uh, and with OMB, uh, but there are complexities uh, and uh, a lot of moving parts right now. I understand all of that and I, I don't, um, want to minimize it, but is there any progress that you can report from, from the hearing in, in October about what it would take to, to get us to some, some notion of parity that, that Mock J would, would think would be fair? So that, that's exactly the work that's underway right now. Is there um, some uh, uh, end date? Is there, is, there, is there a report that you're going to produce? Is, is there some point that you can report back to the council and say, We've looked at it, here's what we think it will take, here's a re-recommend, and, and will it be in this budget cycle? So it's something that we're talking to OMB and to the defenders about now. Um, as I said, there are 
a bunch of unknowns, including what the state uh, budget is going to look like uh, and how, not state budget, but the contribution from the state is gonna look like this year, next year, and over the next four years. Uh, so I can't give you a date. Okay. Do you have a question? Uh, sure, just uh, quickly. I wanted to go into uh, the crisis management system quickly. Sure. Um, so fiscal year 19, funding a 1.75 million for mobile trauma units. Can you just speak to some of the work uh, mobile units are doing now, and yeah. what do you anticipate? How are you prioritizing the, the utilization of uh, the mobile units? And then also, if you can speak to um, 1.4 million additionally being added to, to reach um, folks at the detention facility centers, including Rikers Island, Horizon Juvenile Center, yeah. and Crossroads Detention Center, um, do you anticipate you'll also be expanding out into the juvenile facilities. So if you can speak to that. Yep, so we have a lot to say on that and uh, my colleague Eric Cumberbatch will address some of those issues. Do I have to be sworn in, sir? Uh, Laura, you wanna, yes, uh, you wanna swear in? Well, though you could have the privilege. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present on the MTU and uh, the DOC Horizon and Crossroads. Just speak pieces. a little louder. We're being serenaded right now, which is good. It's a beautiful song taking place yes. behind me. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present on the MTU, uh, the DOC work that we're doing, uh, and also the work in Horizon and Crossroad, um, all great pieces. Um, the mobile trauma units, the MTUs as we call them, are units uh, where, where we most importantly want to be uh, on the scene and in areas where people have experienced traumatic events or any adverse occurrences. Uh, the unit will be equipped with grief counselors uh, and other credible messengers that could really link people to services in real time, um, meeting them where they are. Uh, oftentimes what we see, in, in, uh, especially around violent crime scenes, is just a law enforcement presence. Uh, and we wanna have a presence of, that promotes healing. Um, we know that hurt people are more likely to hurt other people, and we want to begin to heal uh, environments and individuals immediately. Um, we also want to have a long-standing footprint in communities when these things happen. Um, we, we, we don't want to redirect and or tell people to just find services that may exist in their borough, um, but we're actually seeking to bring uh, these services to the people on the ground. Uh, to date, um, we've made purchases of the MTU vehicles. Uh, in your borough, Queens Life Camp uh, has made their purchase of a mobile trauma unit. Um, and we have three others that were purchased. Um, we're in different stages or phases in terms of rollout. Uh, one is actually securing the physical vehicles. Um, but they have been purchased. Uh, we have them and we're, we're working to equip them, wrap them, um, and get them on board. I think it will be one of the, the more unique pieces that New York City has um, and that separates us nationally. Um, so it's a game changer. Um, the work that we're doing in DOC is in the Enhanced Secured Housing Unit. Um, which houses a lot of the key influencers of, uh, or key drivers of violence on Rikers Island. And really what we want to do is link them to credible messengers uh, that we have across the crisis management system for a number of reasons. One, to work on behavior change uh, in, in the place uh, where we have access to the individual. Two, to promote healing within the facility. Um, how do we, we begin to uh, uh, normalize healing amongst a very vulnerable population, um, oftentimes that cannot show uh, emotion and or need um, to seek services, so to bring that. 
The other part is to really humanize the individuals and, and approach them understanding that uh, oftentimes the perpetrator is the victim and vice versa. Um, in doing that, it gives us great touch points to the individuals, but not only the individuals in the Enhanced Secured Housing Unit, but also their network, which may be part of driving violent crime in community. It also gives us a touch point to link individuals that are coming out of DOC custody uh, to our other service providers in the crisis management system across the five boroughs. So it's a, a great touch point. Um, for us, our office strives to be in every space where there's young people with, with risk factors, um, and it's our job to mitigate those levels of distress and disorder in their lives, in their community, and, and network. Um, <clears throat> we are doing work on Horizon. We have two teams um, working with the adolescent population. Uh, we have one team that's specifically focused on, again, the drivers, um, which is more uh, gang-oriented and crew-affiliation-oriented. Uh, and we have a second team uh, in Horizons that's doing more so uh, healing, uh, a lot of uh, uh, youth empowerment workshops, a lot of coaching, and then still both organizations are linking to the networks that are on the ground and then linking these individuals back to um, supportive services. And not just juveniles, correct? Correct. Okay, got it. Uh, Crossroads, we, we work with the youngest population. Um, and there, there's phenomenal work being done on supporting young people, um, helping those young people have vision and understanding of where they are in this continuum uh, along the justice system. Uh, really working with family members to help them understand the justice system. And again, uh, a lot of workshops around empowerment, support, um, and youth building. So we're in those spaces uh, in a very intentional way uh, with partners that reflect the population that we're working with um, and a population that also has very similar background in, in from their lifestyle. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Uh, just last question for Liz. So um, I know you produce your... Uh, cannabis report, and I'm sure you're still following the data, and the police commissioner was here earlier, and we uh, still in New York City are uh, summonsing and arresting um, majority people of color for, for low-level marijuana offenses. Um, what is your opinion on that? How are you working to sort of curtail this with the department, even as we look towards legalization in New York State? Yeah. So we have seen a really pretty remarkable drop, um, both in marijuana um, arrests, um, also in criminal summonses, uh, also in turnstile jumping. Um, you know, criminal summonses are down 73% since the start of the administration. Um, turnstile jumping, arrests also, you know, down from 28,000 to about 6,000 last year. Um, marijuana has also dropped quite considerably. Um, but you're right that the disparity numbers are incredibly disheartening. And that is why I said, <laughs> I think that we obviously must work every day, and I think my colleagues in the police department and the district attorney's office do work every day to try and reduce that disparity. But we're, there are, it's a much deeper problem than simply within the criminal justice system. And we need to have a much more affirmative approach. We need to do both things, uh, lighten the touch, um, but we also need to have deep investments in education, play, physical space that are very much focused on um, promoting thriving neighborhoods. And I think uh, one of the reasons why I think the work that the Office to Prevent Gun Violence is so important and why the Office, um, why the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety is so important is that it takes a much more affirmative view of what it means to promote safety 
safety being something different than simply reducing crime. All righty, well, thank you for that. I know we, we have to move, but I just wanted to say only 25 white people were summoned and arrested in New York City last year for marijuana. It's just startling, um, you know, I mean, as someone who walks outside these gates and smells marijuana, people smoking it that don't look like me. Yeah. Uh, it's just astounding that we only found 25, and I don't want anybody to be arrested or summoned for it, but um, but it just shows that we have a, a still a long way to go. And if we're talking about closing Rikers Island um, in the realistic time frame or sooner than with the, the current time frame is we really have to get down and deep into these systematic issues that are still uh, overburdening people of color and communities of color. So I want to thank you for the work you've done. I think we have moved the bar certainly forward, but we still have a long way to go to address disparities in the justice system in our city. Thank you. No question. Well, one of the concerns that was raised when the mayor came out with the new marijuana policy was that the um, exemptions to that policy, the people who would still be arrested and, and charged with the misdemeanor, were people with prior or current criminal justice system involvement. And it was predicted that the racial disparities might actually increase because which communities are, are more likely who have been uh, over-policed and, and, and have that prior or current criminal justice system involvement. Um, have you considered rethinking those exemptions and, and doing away with them? Uh, I don't know why somebody's prior criminal justice system involvement would justify arresting them and charging them with a misdemeanor for, for smoking marijuana, um, and predictably, the disparity is actually growing. Yeah, so I think it's uh, definitely something that's worth looking at uh, and considering uh, why there are certain exemptions and not others. Uh, and I know it's something that the police department, uh, as they do with many things, uh, is, you know, looks at every day to see what the effect is. All right, well, we obviously have a lot of other issues that we want to go through. The reality is there probably better to be discussed at the staff level, and we will see you again in uh, May for the, the executive budget. So I appreciate your uh, waiting around, uh, and um, I apologize if you feel that uh, we've given you less of an opportunity to, to tout your successes than in regular years, um, but we do have the benefit of working closely with your office throughout the year, so there isn't very much that you do that, that is, 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 is new to us, and, and we do appreciate the very many good things that you do do. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, the work of my team and of all our partners, I think, speaks for itself. And obviously, uh, as Councilman Richards pointed out, we have a very steep hill ahead of us, um, but hopefully a way forward. All right. We will be in touch with follow-up questions, and we will see the team again in May. Thank you very much. Let me just say for members of the public who won't be able to testify today that uh, our budget hearings are going up until March 26, and we are going to prioritize uh, you being able to testify at hearings throughout the remainder of the budget process up to March 26. Um, so you'll be in touch if you can see our staffs after this hearing. Uh, we certainly will work uh, very closely to ensure that that happens. All right, so our next um, panel, and it's going to have to be the last panel for today, but I think it's an important one. Uh, Janet Sable from the Legal Aid Society, uh, Jared Trujillo um, from also, I think, a legal aid attorney, um, Matt Connect, uh, Neighborhood Defender Services, Justine Oberman from the Bronx Defenders, Lisa Schreibersdorf from Brooklyn Defender Services. Come have a seat and uh, We'll get going.
is Ms. Olderman testifying? There she is. You're up. Not necessarily, but you're you're sitting at the table. Okay. Good. All right. If you would You would raise your right hand so we can get sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Good. Um, I think uh, we'll start with legal aid. We'll put um, we'll put three minutes on the clock. If you urgently need to go beyond that, we will be flexible. At some point, though, you're going to be competing with bagpipes, and you're not going to win that fight. button. Okay. Again, thank you very much for um, inviting us to testify before the, the Council Committee on Justice System um, for the prelimin to, to, to talk about the preliminary budget and its impact on legal aid's clients and services. Uh, we thank you, Chairman Lansman and, um, and Chairman Richards for this. Sorry, I just, let me just stand correctly. We'll, we'll do five minutes. Okay. okay. Thank you. So legal aid um, as you know, is much more than a law firm for clients who can't afford to pay for counsel. We're an indispensable component of the legal, social, and economic fabric of New York City. Um, we, ca in order to, our, we capture that um, that role because we capitalize on the diverse expertise, experience, and capabilities of more than 1,200 uh, 1,200 attorneys who work alongside over 900 social workers, investigators, paralegals, and support and administrative staff in our office, carrying a caseload of 300 legal matters a year. We take on more cases for more clients who cannot afford to pay for private counsel than any other legal services organization in the U.S. We rely on city funding to do this, and that's, of course, why we're here today. So just to get to the, to cut to the chase, we're here and we're talking on behalf of all the public defender organizations um, because staff retention is an absolutely essential um, challenge to the viability and the continued success of legal aid and the other organizations. In order to attract and retain our highly skilled and dedicated staff, we seek restored and enhanced support from the city to ensure that we can continue to deliver high quality, comprehensive criminal defense and civil legal services. Um, our ability, uh, so what we're asking for today is uh, that you include 12 to $15 million for the Legal Aid Society in the 2020 budget um, and that I, I believe I have the authority to speak on behalf of the other uh, defender organizations to say that that would be a total of 25 to 30 million for all the defender organizations to bring us into parity with Corporation Council, the law department. Um, we believe that the, uh, the objections to or the, that Mock J's uh, concerns about whether this can be done or not are, um, are easily refuted. Um, contracts can be amended and always are, so the fact that we have negotiated contracts for the coming year is really um, not an impediment to increasing our budget. While intake is down, that's great for New York City and we're happy to, um, that that is the case, but uh, the city has already committed to increasing the defense budget uh, for the DA, uh, and to increase the uh, budget for the DAs to reflect pay parity with Corporation Council. If, if it can be done for the DAs, it can absolutely and must be done for us um, at the Legal Aid Society and among all the defender organizations. And further, the state money that was referred to that has been increased, the IELTS money, uh, Immigrant Legal Services, is by definition, by statute, not permitted to supplant the county's Gideon responsibility. 
So we don't think that there is any impediment to the city moving forward and really no justification for the city not to embrace what is an absolutely crucial um, uh, a crucial need for the, the defender organizations and for the legal aid society as a whole. Our ability to compensate our staff is, um, is really limited by the monies that we receive from the city and it is further limited by other distinctions that were not really mentioned by, um, by the mayor's office and that is that we have to pay for rent, we have to pay for health care, we have to pay for pension benefits. Right now, Legal Aid spends 7.8% of its criminal defense budget on rent. Um, we pay 17% of our budget on health insurance, and we pay 5% um, of our total budget, budget goes to retirement benefits. Those are dollars that do not come out of the DA's budget and do not come out of Corp Council's budget, so when they get a pay increase, they're able to put it entirely to salaries, which we're not able to do. Um, um, look, uh, I wanna, I know there are a lot of people, um, so I'm gonna cede some time to um, my colleague, the new president of the ALAA Association, um, but we cannot continue to underpay our staff and so we re reiterate our request of 12 to $15 million to bring legal aid into parity with Corporation Council and 25 to $30 million for the other defenders. And respectfully refer you to the rest of our written testimony for other issues relevant to the criminal defense practice. Thank you. Sir. Well, good evening. Um, thank you uh, for inviting me here. My name is Jared Trujillo. I am the uh, new president-elect of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys, UAW 2325. Um, <clears throat> I represent 1,200 members, and there's no way that you could talk about criminal justice without, or immigration justice, or fixing the school to prison pipeline, uh, or really helping low-income New Yorkers at all without talking about the way that my 1,200 members are, are compensated, um, and the fact that our pay is unequal, and it's a crisis, and it's leading to our members, le uh, it's leading to our members leaving. We meet people on the worst day of their lives, when they're locked in cages, and we are their, we're often their only hope to get them out. We meet children in foster care um, in, in some of the worst situations of their lives, and we fight to represent them and to make them know that they're heard. We are the only hope for some folks uh, that are migrants, that want to stay in a country that is the only home that they've known for their entire lives. We help people navigate the complicated labyrinth of the IRS, and we give them hope. Um, but what else, what else do we do? We're Lyft drivers, we're babysitters, we, we grade exams, we're tutors, we're delivery drivers. And we do all that because we don't have equal salaries and we do all that because it's the only way for my 1,200 members to be able to, uh, to afford to support themselves in this expensive city when we have unequal salaries and when we don't have pensions at all. I, I want to talk a bit about the debt, also about the student debt load of a lot of our members. Right now, 65% of our members have student debt, student loans, and these are necessary, a necessary cost of going to law school. Of that 65%, 20% owe between $50,000 and $100,000. 29% owe between $100,000 and $200,000. And 38% of our members owe over $200,000 worth of debt just to become lawyers. It is offensive for us to look across a courtroom at someone who works in the law department and see that they make more than us. It is offensive for someone who grew up, particularly for our attorneys of color, who might have grown up, who grew up in these communities, and they want to represent the members of those communities, and for the city to show us that our work is not as valuable as someone that works in Corp Council or the law department just because of who we represent. For the city to show us that us putting equity and time into representing low-income New Yorkers on, on the worst days of their lives, in the worst situation of their lives, and that that's not compensated the same way that someone who works in the law department is, it's the reason why people leave. They leave because they don't feel that their work is dignified or that, that, um, that the city is, uh, sees the dignity of their work. 
and they often leave because life happens and because they just cannot afford to continue working at legal aid on, on our current salaries. They want to get married. Uh, so one of my members left just a few weeks ago because their dog got sick. They racked up a lot of credit card debt trying to, to care for their dog, and they just could not afford to do that on a legal aid salary. These are real stories. Um, along with our written testimony, we have the testimonials of 22 of our legal, or, or 22 of my members. And it really shows you just the human side of how difficult it is for us to survive in this city, doing work that we really care about, representing the most, the most marginalized folks of the city, how difficult that is to do on our, with our salaries. It's the reason why 48% of my members leave after 10 years, because after 10 years, there's about a $17,000 pay gap in between what we're paid and what someone from the law department is paid. And that it, it's only exacerbated by the fact that we don't have uh, defined pensions like they do. So I, I, I would ask, um, so first, thank you uh, for your time. Uh, I would ask though that you read through our written submission to see the difficulties of a lot of my members as far as just trying to survive in this city, doing work that they truly love that some of us are just forced out of because we can't afford to continue doing it. Um, and with that, I would just ask uh, that this body uh, look into, like seriously look into pay parity for us, but also into a loan forgiveness program from the city because our debt loads are so high and they're only growing. Thank you. Thank you. I really just want to applaud what you just heard because I, I really, it was said so perfectly. I've had two people come to me recently and ask for an advance on their salary because they're getting evicted. And these are the kinds of stories that we hear every day. And thank you very much for coming and speaking on behalf of not even just only the legal aid attorneys, but all the attorneys that work and, and the staff that work in our offices. Um, and I wanna also uh, reinforce that, um, that if you could look at a student loan assistance program, which I think I brought up one time before, which we haven't really put together paperwork on that for you, but that that I think would be a really profound impact. And there is some student loan assistance by the state, but it doesn't kick in until the third year. And by that time, people are so far behind, even, you know, it, it helps them a little bit. Um, and, and some of the federal programs are falling apart where if they work for 10 years, they could be forgiven, but they've had zero, basically almost zero people getting that forgiveness. Hopefully after this administration, that'll come back and some people will have a chance to do it. Um, so. I'm Lisa Schreibersoft, Executive Director of Brooklyn Defendant Services. Um, I want to say that um, yes to everything that's been said. I would like to talk just directly about family defense practice because this is a space where in addition to pay parity, our budget is extremely, we are very, very short funded and we would like the city council to help us really try to make the mayor understand what it takes to do that representation despite dramatic increases in removals of children and family separation, where parent representation probably has one of the most significant impacts on how long children are separated from their families and, um, and how maybe, whether they are in the first place and how long that lasts. That the representation that we give our clients has already been shown you know, in many places to have a dramatic impact on um, you know, reuniting families or keeping them together in the first place safely. So despite rising, rising, rising ACS removals and actions and filings, our funding did not rise at all from last year to this year. And um, it had already been cut last year from the year before. So um, I'm asking you to take a look. I think for all the defenders, and there are four defenders, CFR is not here today, but it's my office, neighborhood defender, uh, Bronx defenders, it's probably something like, I think we said about 10 million probably to set us right. Um, there was just recently a um, report by the Commission on Parental Representation which was uh, created by Judge DeFiori and they are recommending that you look at about 50 cases per attorney. I just wanna say that I have more attorneys leaving my family practice than any other practice in my office because on top of not being able to, and if we had had time, one of my members, uh, one of my employees was gonna speak, on top of not being able to afford to live, they were also managing completely unmanageable caseloads in the most dire of circumstances where people were losing their children. 
And um, so we really do need the council to really make this commitment to talking very specifically about this one practice area and making sure that we are able to, you know, basically do all the good work that we need to do for these people. These are the poorest and in many ways most vulnerable people. They are often mentally ill, drug addicted, uh, struggling with poverty in ways that are really profound. And especially in a place like Brooklyn, Bronx, things are, you know, Harlem, where gentrification is happening and people are no longer able to live in housing that is suitable in many ways, you know, even for children. So um, with that, I'm gonna pass it to Matt. Good evening, uh, I'm Matt Connect. I'm the Managing Director at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. Um, the issue of public defender compensation, um, what we've been talking about is pay parity, uh, is an issue that's really critically important to all of our organizations. And so I am truly appreciative of the opportunity to come here today uh, to talk to you guys uh, about pay parity. Um, I know that uh, you all know this already, uh, but I just want to make it clear that uh, we're, not seek we're not here seeking a windfall for our staff. Uh, we're seeking uh, a basic living wage uh, that will allow our really talented and diverse staffs uh, and the attorneys um, to do the work they love, uh, for the clients that they love, uh, in the city that they love. Um, and they're just not able to do it long term with the pay scale as it stands now. Um, you heard a lot about the um, issues that go into sort of <laughs> forcing lawyers out the door at three years, five years, six years, um, and certainly I uh, agree with all of those statements. Um, I would say from an organizational point of view, it's a tremendous blow to an organization to invest three, four, five years training staff, developing staff, investing time and resources into their professional development, only to see them then leave um, to go do the work someplace else where it's not as expensive to live or where the pay scale um, um, reflects the cost of living uh, much better than it does here in this city. Um, I also want to um, just highlight one issue that's sort of unique to Neighborhood Defender Service, um, which is a community-based office. Um, we serve Northern Manhattan. Um, all of our clients reside in Northern Manhattan. Um, we at one time had a staff that lived primarily in Northern Manhattan, in the community that we serve. Um, and our staff is being forced out of the community. Um, our clients and the community benefited greatly um, by attorneys who, who had relationships with churches, with other places of worship, with schools, with tenant associations, with other community groups. Um, and as our staff uh, finds it more and more difficult to live in northern Manhattan, uh, we run the risk of losing those relationships. And at the end of the day, that costs our clients. So uh, we're here today asking for pay parity. Um, I'd ask you to please take a close look at it. Um, please make sure that our staff uh, has the ability to earn a living wage uh, and take a look at the Corporation Council pay scale. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Justine Olderman, and I'm the Executive Director of the Bronx Defenders. You've heard, I think, three sort of categories of um, funding challenges that we are all facing. You've heard about failure to fund our programs at a sufficient level to meet our client needs. You've heard about the failure of our contracts to account for the increasing costs in salaries, rent, and health care, um, and, uh, and pension. And you have heard about the issue with pay parity, and all of that is true for the Bronx Defenders. I want to add one other element um, in terms of one of the challenges that we all face, which is the limitation on the nature of the work that is contracted for by the city. And what I mean by that is that our contracts are usually restricted in the scope of services to representation between the courthouse walls. We are funded to represent people once a case is filed. And one of the other limitations and challenges that we find is the lack of funding for us to be able to do preventive advocacy work, to in essence create an off-ramp to the legal system and divert people away from court altogether. But rather than dig into all of those, because I think you have plenty of that in terms of what you've heard from today and what you'll have in our written testimony, I did just want to spend a moment, especially as closing out this hearing for today, to reflect on something that I've been thinking about, which is that we all come here every year, every year without stretched hands. Every year we come and make the case to all of you that we don't have enough money to do the important work that we're doing. 
And we're all super mindful of the fact that you have a lot of people and a lot of amazing organizations in this city that are coming to you, not just you know, the justice system organizations, but across the city saying, my work is important and my work matters. And I thought, well, what can we do today to help you understand why our work matters and why there should be an investment by the city in our programs? And I realized that at the core of why we come back here every year, I would say is a fundamental misunderstanding about who we are, what we do, what our value is, and what the impact is to the city. We are often thought of as being legal service providers. There's nothing wrong with that. It is an honorable profession. It is important work. But in many ways, that understanding is fundamentally flawed and insufficient. Legal services suggest that there is a need and the city has an obligation, sometimes that's constitutional, sometimes it's not, to meet that need. And if that's the framework with which we come to the budget discussion and the framing around our funding needs, then of course it's just gonna be what can we eke out? How can we meet that need? How can we check that box and say, we have provided what we are obligated to provide? And so I guess I'd like to introduce a different way of thinking about it and one that I am confident every service provider in this room feels is accurate, which is that we are not just legal service <laughs> providers. We are in many ways laboratories for justice. We protect people's rights. We stand up against abuses. We uphold the dignity of New Yorkers in what has been referenced as some of their worst moments, and moments when they're facing the loss of custody of their children, the loss of their housing, their loss of employment, their loss of benefits, their loss of their liberty. We are there. We are proximate to the people. We are proximate to the problems. And not only that, we are the solution. If you just look at what has happened in this city because of the providers in this room, it's kind of astonishing. This groundbreaking NIFA program has increased the chances of detained immigrants winning their deportation case by 11%. In the, in the report that just came out by OCJ today, you're gonna see that in the last year alone, access to counsel and housing court has decreased evictions by 14%. There are studies that show that public defense can actually reduce incarceration rates by 16% and incarceration lengths by 24% and pretrial detention by 9% just based on having the right investment in public defense. And there's data from our own offices showing that when we do that preventive work, we can keep children safely at home in numbers that are like 80%. So, what I encourage you to think about as you wrestle with what are understandably incredibly hard questions is that our role is much more than simply checking a box and meeting a need. We are literally in this room the change that this city wants to see. And it's not just for the individuals we stand next to and defend. It is not just honestly for this city. It's not just for the state. It is for the country. What we have already shown we can do just by investing in our organizations is transforming not only the way people are represented, it is transforming legal systems from one end of this country to the next. It is delivering justice. And so when grappling with the questions, I guess I just want to leave you with one, one framework, one question to ask yourselves as you decide, is it worth it to invest in these organizations, is it worth it to give them the funding that they need? Because we are talking about a real investment. We are essentially talking about what is the change that we want to see in the world? And how much is that worth? Thank you. Well, that's a very powerful um, statement. And uh, what's, very, what's so frustrating on our end of the, the table and um, you know that we've been fighting alongside you, at least for the five years that I've had the committee, and I'm, I'm sure um, before then, is that we, city government, have asked you 
at least over those, these last five years, to take on more and more responsibility, to be more than just defense counsel in the four corners of the courtroom. We have asked you to, to view yourselves as holistic providers of, of services um, to relieve the city and to meet um, the, 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 the burden that the city has in so many of our uh, social and, and economic problems being channeled through the criminal justice system or the immigration justice system. And all of our defenders have responded uh, remarkably. The things that all of your offices do, um, you are here testifying before this committee on a regular basis on everything from immigration to housing to family court to, to you name it. And so it is um, profoundly frustrating that we have to fight with the, the mayor. Um, we have to argue with the mayor's office of criminal justice about the need to compensate your professionals appropriately so that they're able to do this work without taking a second or a third job or without having to leave um, before they've, they've really um, uh, blossomed. Thank you, sir. Um, I remember we had a hearing, I would say it was about two years ago, before the, um, before the RFP for the current contract was even finalized. And, and we had compelled Mock J to include some notion of holistic services and wraparound uh, uh, services and whatever term you want to use. And it was profoundly disappointing when, despite all of the commitments that the, the, the mayor's office made, um, at the end of the day, they didn't provide the resources for you to really do what you do. You still do them. You figure out how to uh, beg, borrow, and steal um, to make it happen. Uh, I'm very hopeful that this will be the year that we get some parity and some recognition of the work that you do so that you can keep on doing it. Because I don't think there's anyone in this building or any city agency that doubts or questions the value of the work that you do and its benefit to the city of New York. And the numbers that you recite about the, 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 the percentage of people who are not being deported, the percentage of families who are not being separated, the percentage of people who are not sitting on Rikers Island because of the work that you do, I, we see that. So hopefully this will be the year. Well, thank you for all of your support over the past years and just being here today, we know that we're in the room with allies and supporters for our applications. I agree with everything he said. <laughs> um, I apologize for the sense of, of rush. Um, we did move things around to make sure that you had an opportunity to, to, to speak today. Uh, this meeting is not gonna, this hearing is not gonna be closed, it's gonna be adjourned. We still have to hear from the Office of Civil Justice, and there are other legal services providers that we wanna hear from, um, but I cannot think of a, a better way to close this uh, portion of the hearing as, as the mu music grows louder and louder next door um, with the testimony of, of all of you. Mm, all right. Thank you. With that, we're going to adjourn the hearing until a later date. Um, and let me also just take this opportunity to thank Rachel uh, Kagan, my chief of staff and counsel, for all the work that she does making this happen. Thank you.